Hello, my name is Andrew Beal. I'm the author of Trail Guide to the Body, and I want to welcome you to the wonderful world of palpation. Imagine being able to feel the difference between the biceps brachii and the brachialis muscle. What if you could confidently locate the second rib, or isolate the piriformis to relieve a patient's sciatica pain? Well, if those sound appealing, you've come to the right place. There are three aspects of palpation. First, locating a structure. Second, becoming aware of its characteristics. And third, assessing its quality or condition so you can determine how to treat it. This presentation highlights those first two, the location and characteristics of structures. And although we'll discover many things along our way, we'll focus on the major muscles of the body. Now, the question arises, just how important are palpation skills anyway? Well, I think it's hard to overstate. And that's because for a manual therapist, palpation is like the ABC, essential building block. But unlike the rote learning of spelling, palpation is a continual journey of discovery where each and every body deepens your kinesthetic skills. Now, like the alphabet, the power of palpation is in its application. Whether you practice or are hoping to practice Swedish massage, physical therapy, acupuncture, any one of a number of other modalities, having a solid foundation of palpatory anatomy skills will bring a vital precision and effectiveness to your work. It's that simple. This presentation is a companion piece to the Trail Guide to the Body text. You know, if I had my way, it'd be about 40 hours in length. But we don't have that kind of time, and I suspect you wouldn't even have that sort of patience. But don't worry. The art and skill of palpation develop through multiple experiences and comparisons. And after you watch this presentation a few times, I encourage you to do just that. Experience and compare on many different people. Exploring one deltoid muscle, nice job. A hundred deltoids, well now you're really talking. So what we've given you here is an introduction and we'll focus on five aspects of the major muscles of the body. First, how to position your partner and have the muscle engage or contract. Second, the key bony landmarks that isolate the muscle and its attachment sites. Third, how to palpate it, get your hands on it, and feel its texture and fiber direction. Fourth, how to differentiate the muscle from surrounding muscles and structures. And fifth, how to shorten and lengthen the muscle. So before we begin, how about a few palpation tips? First of all, allow your hands and fingers to be soft and responsive. Secondly, as you begin exploring, you may periodically want to close your eyes just to enhance your awareness. Smaller structures can be best accessed with a fingertip or two, whereas larger structures are best accessed with your whole hand. As you begin exploring the body, you may find that structures don't come into your fingers as readily as you might like. And a common response is to start pressing harder and deeper into the body. Well, Instead of pressing into the tissue, try inviting the tissues into your hands. Gentle contact will allow your fingers to be receptive, whereas excessive pressure just numbs out the digits and makes for a generally uncomfortable experience for your partner. Ow. You may also consider first locating a structure on your own body before palpating it on your partner. Now here's an important one. Have patience with your learning process. Look, just because you've had a trapezius muscle your entire life doesn't mean you're going to be able to instantly locate it and explore it on your partner. No, it's okay if you get lost, make a wrong turn on the body. Chances are you're very close to what you're looking for. Last but not least, when in doubt, ask the body. When you begin palpating, you may be a little confused or overwhelmed about the structures you're trying to find, but when in doubt, go ahead and ask the body that you're trying to access. For example, I could ask the question, what tendon is this that I see right here on the top of the foot? Well, that leads to the question, where does it go to and from? So if I follow it, it seems to lead here to the hallucis or big toe. And if I follow it the opposite direction, it seems to pass along the top of the foot and then disappear here at the top of the ankle. Okay, well, what if I ask my partner to flex his toes? Go ahead and curl your toes under. Does that do anything? Not really. And if you go ahead and extend your toes, go the other way, well, wow, now the tendon really becomes taut and very visible. And 
I've just deduced just by asking those questions that that tendon is the tendon of the extensor hallucis longus muscle. That's the long muscle that extends the hallucis, or big toe. So always remember that you're never alone. The body is just waiting to help you. The triangular-shaped deltoid is located on the cap of the shoulder. The origin of the deltoid, which is interestingly enough identical to the insertion of the trapezius, curves around the spine of the scapula and clavicle, forming a V-shape. And from this broad origin, the fibers converge down the arm to attach to the deltoid tuberosity. The deltoid's a great muscle to start with because it's totally accessible right here on the cap of the shoulder. So I could do this supine or prone or sideline, but I like seated because you can really access all sides of the muscle. So let's begin by seeing this muscle engage. I'm just gonna ask my partner to go ahead and try to abduct your arm against my resistance. Oh, that's great. And there we see a fabulous example of the deltoid. Here's that posterior edge, and there we can see that anterior edge there and you really get a sense of the convergent fibers all funneling down to that deltoid tuberosity. Good, go ahead and relax. Now let's locate some of the landmarks that really isolate where the deltoid is. First, I'm gonna find this attachment here at the top of the shoulder, where they sort of form a V here at the top. And the first side of that is gonna be the spine of the scapula. This is that superficial ridge of bone that sort of runs up to the top of the shoulder. And notice I'm not, I'm not poking in with my finger, no. I'm just using a nice set of broad finger pads to really differentiate the edge of that bone. And then it ends right here at the acromion, at the top of the shoulder. And then the deltoid's attachment continues here onto that lateral portion of the clavicle. And again, there's that shape of that attachment. Then all of those fibers come down and attach at that deltoid tuberosity. And if you ever get confused of exactly where the deltoid tuberosity is, you can divide the arm in half. Pretty much right there at the halfway point is where that sort of small, subtle sort of mound of bone on the side of the humerus is located. And that's the other attachment for the deltoid. Great. So now that I know that all of this is the deltoid and it's completely superficial, I can just get my fingers on it here just grasp it and lift it up off the arm. There we go. And you can really roll your fingers across its fibers and follow them again right down as they converge at the tuberosity. Good. Now, let's just take a moment to differentiate a few things. I'm going to ask my partner to just go ahead and try to flex your arm that way and a little bit out to the side. Great. And there we can see the line that divides the deltoid from the pectoralis major. That's called your deltopectoral groove. And so here we've got those anterior fibers of the deltoid, and there we have the pectoralis major. Good. Here we have the edge of the biceps brachii. There we can even see some of the triceps. Great. And relax. Because the deltoid is an antagonist to itself, here's a fun little thing you can do. I'm just going to ask my partner to just go ahead and try to flex his shoulder. So he's going to try to swing his arm that way. Great. So flexion engages these, the anterior fibers of the deltoid, and they're clearly engaged. But the posterior fibers back here are totally relaxed. They're not doing anything. And now conversely, if I ask him to go ahead and try to extend at the shoulder, there we go. Well, now the posterior fibers are contracting, but the anterior fibers are not doing anything. So it's just a fun way you can see how the deltoid, being a convergent muscle, is really an antagonist to itself and how when one part of it engages, the other part has to relax. And finally, if I wanted to shorten the anterior fibers of the deltoid, I can passively flex the shoulder like so, even medially rotate it, which conversely lengthens the posterior fibers. And if I want to shorten the posterior fibers, I can extend the shoulder, which then, of course, lengthens the anterior fibers. And if I wanted to shorten the entire deltoid, I can passively abduct the shoulder and then to lengthen it, of course, I can adduct the shoulder.
The trapezius lies superficially along the upper back and neck. Its broad, thin fibers blanket the shoulders, attaching to the occiput at the base of the head, the lateral clavicle, the scapula, and the spinous processes of the thoracic vertebrae. Chances are, if you've ever given someone a shoulder rub, you're a little familiar with this muscle. So let's give it a shot. First thing I'm going to do is locate the bony landmarks that really isolate the tendinous attachments of this muscle. And the first one is going to be at the base of the head, the superior nuchal line, right here. Now, I can see this easily because my partner is bald, but even if he weren't, I can pretty much draw a line straight across the top of the ears, and that's going to be the location of that superior nuchal line. And there we have a very pronounced external occipital protuberance. So this is going to be one bony landmark that will be important for the upper fibers of the trapezius. Then we can come down to the scapula and clavicle and palpate and locate the spine of the scapula here just off the top of the shoulder. Notice I'm not poking in with my finger. No, I'm just going to use the broad finger pads and there's that superficial line. And if I follow it out to the acromion at the cap of the shoulder, there's that bald surface right there. And then if I follow the acromion over to the lateral portion of the clavicle, there. And that J will be an important attachment site for the upper and middle fibers of the trapezius. And then finally, the last bony landmark or landmarks will be the spinous processes of C7 all the way down to T12. Now, there's a lot of spinous processes, so how do we find those? Well, luckily, the spinous process of C7 is right at the base of the neck and is more prominent than the surrounding landmarks. And sure enough, there's his C7. And now it's really just a matter of counting down. T1, and there's a little gap, and then T2, and a little gap, and there's T3. And you just walk your fingers all the way down systematically as you find all of these spinous processes. And it's really worth the time to actually do this because you notice that not all spinous processes are lined up as maybe they should be. And some are a little larger than others. And there we are down to T12. So we've got the spinous processes of C7 to T12, the clavicle and the spine of the scapula, and the superior nuchal line. Those are three landmarks that are going to help isolate the trapezius. So let's get our hands on some of this. Let's uh, first find the upper fibers of the trapezius. I'm going to just bring my partner's arm off the side of the table. And I'm just going to grasp some of this tissue here on the top of the neck and the top of the shoulder. And this flap of muscle tissue right here is the trapezius. Now, notice I'm not doing this. Well, this is the rhomboids, the trap, a bit of levator scapula. No, no, no. We just want this this flap of tissue right here as it goes right up to the base of the head. And if I ask my partner to just raise his head off the face cradle just about an inch or so, that's great. I can really feel that tissue contract, very superficial, right on the top of the neck. And then relax, and I can follow this edge all the way down to that lateral clavicle. So that right there is the upper portion of your trapezius. Then, to find the middle fibers, I'm going to just ask my partner to raise his elbow just off the table a bit. And there, we can see a great example of those middle fibers spanning across this way, right above the rhomboids. And if I set my fingers on them as he's engaging, there we can really feel those fibers as they run this way, like so. Good. Go ahead and relax. And finally, the lower fibers of the trapezius can be engaged by Go ahead and bring your arms just straight out in front of you like Superman, sort of holding them out there. And as he holds his arm out there, the lower fibers of the trapezius contract to stabilize the scapula. And there we can see a nice line, that edge of the lower fibers of the trap. And while he's contracting, I'm just going to roll my fingers across them here. They're very palpable and superficial. And you can see where they head right down to that spinous process of T12 where we were palpating before. Good. Go ahead and relax. So finally, I can shorten and lengthen portions of the trapezius in different ways. The upper fibers and the lower fibers are antagonists. 
So the upper fibers elevate the scapula, while the lower fibers depress the scapula. So if I wanted to shorten the upper fibers, I'm going to elevate the scapula, which lengthens the lower fibers. And conversely, if I want to shorten the lower fibers, I can depress the scapula, and that lengthens the upper fibers. And finally, to shorten the middle fibers, I can scoop the shoulder and adduct the shoulder closer to the spine, just like so. And that's your trapezius. Very thin, very superficial, but very accessible. The latissimus dorsi is the broadest muscle of the back. Its thin, superficial fibers originate at the low back, ascend the side of the trunk, and merge into a thick bundle at the axilla. The teres major is called Lat's little helper because it is a complete synergist with the latissimus dorsi. It is superficial and located along the scapula's lateral border between the latissimus dorsi and the teres minor. Let's begin by engaging the latissimus dorsi. I'm going to ask my partner to medially rotate his shoulders. And how that'll happen is I'll ask him to just go ahead and try to press his hand into my leg, which is conveniently there. And as he medially rotates the humerus, there we can see all of that latissimus dorsi and the teres major engage. And while he continues, I can really feel that tissue as it converges and funnels into the axilla. Go ahead and relax. And sure enough, all of this tissue now softens up. Good. So let's begin with the latissimus dorsi. Probably the easiest way to get your hands on some of it is to sort of scoop up that lateral edge right there. And if I'm not quite sure if I'm on it, I can ask him to immediately rotate again. So he's going to press his hand. There you go, and all of this tissue suddenly gets much more difficult to lift up. Good, and relax. Now, I'm not grasping this. This is skin, and you can tell it's skin because it's sort of gelatinous, and it doesn't have any, well, meat to it. But if I reach in a little more, all of this is going to be the latissimus dorsi, and it certainly gets much thicker as it converges and bundles right here on the posterior axilla. And then as I follow it inferiorly, it becomes much thinner as it merges into that thoracolumbar aponeurosis, that big piece of fascia on the low back. So if this is my latissimus dorsi, where's going to be a synergist, the teres major? Well, the easiest place to start is to find the lateral border of the scapula. So I'm just going to sort of work my partner's shoulder here a little bit. And there I can find the inferior angle of the scapula. And if I walk my thumb along that edge, there I can find the lateral border, which is where the teres major will attach. So if I ask my partner to go ahead and engage again and try to immediately rotate, wow, it's a very dense mass of muscle tissue running right off that lateral border. Good, go ahead and relax. And so I can access it directly, just right on top of the muscle belly, right there. Or I can scoop up underneath, sort of taking the latissimus dorsi with me, sort of like grabbing a hamburger. And there I can feel the teres major underneath my fingers, like so. Very accessible tissue. Thank you. Finally, we can lengthen the teres major and latissimus dorsi by abducting the shoulder, laterally rotating it, and even bringing it up like so. And then finally, we can shorten the muscles by bringing the arm next to the body like so, which adducts the shoulder joint. We can also access these muscles in a supine position. I can take my partner's arm and flex the shoulder, and then if I ask him to try to bring his elbow toward his hip, go ahead and extend. There you can see a fabulous example of how the latissimus dorsi comes up on the side of the torso and coming into here at the axilla. And go ahead and relax. And I can really get my hands on that flap of tissue here on the side of the torso. And as I come up closer, I find that there is the bulky 
tissue of the teres major. Good. And finally, this is a nice place to also lengthen and shorten the muscle. To lengthen these muscles, I can bring the arm up overhead to full flexion, and to shorten them, of course, bring the arm back to the side into a neutral state. The supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis are known as the rotator cuff muscles. Together, they encompass and therefore stabilize the glenohumeral joint. All of the rotator cuff muscles are very accessible. The chunky supraspinatus is located in the supraspinous fossa, deep to the trapezius's upper fibers. Its belly runs underneath the acromion and attaches to the humerus's greater tubercle. Four muscles that stabilize the glenohumeral or shoulder joint. Big job, very important. Let's get a handle on them. I'm going to begin with the supraspinatus. There you can see that small rotator cuff muscle that sits right off the top of the shoulder. And probably the easiest way to get a handle on it is to find that spine of the scapula here that runs at an angle up toward the acromion. And if I let my fingers slide superior into the supraspinous fossa, there I can feel, deep to those fibers of the trapezius, the supraspinatus belly right there. And as I follow it laterally, it gets a little thinner and a little more tendinous, and there it passes underneath the acromion to attach to that greater tubercle of the humerus here, deep to the deltoid. So if I want to feel the supraspinatus contract, I'm going to just ask my partner to just try to abduct your shoulder a little bit, press against my hand, and there, deep again to those trapezius fibers, that muscle, it's a small little guy, definitely contracts and relax and there it definitely softens up. Now, finally, to shorten or lengthen the supraspinatus, I can come over to the side and I can shorten the supraspinatus by abducting the shoulder and I can lengthen it by bringing the arm back to the side of the body, adducting the shoulder. The flat, convergent belly of the infraspinatus is located in the infraspinous fossa. Most of its belly is superficial with the medial portion deep to the trapezius and a lateral portion beneath the deltoid. The teres minor is a small muscle squeezed between the infraspinatus and teres major. It is located high in the axilla and can be challenging to grasp. So now let's isolate the second and third rotator cuff muscles, the infraspinatus and the teres minor. So let's begin with the infraspinatus. The easiest way to find its belly is to isolate the three bony landmarks that surround it. That would include the spine of the scapula here, the medial border of the scapula here, there's the inferior angle, and then the lateral border of the scapula here. And if I set my fingers along these three landmarks, they sort of form a bit of a triangle. And that's where that infraspinatus belly is going to be before all the convergent fibers come this way to pass underneath the deltoid and attach at that greater tubercle of the humerus. So if I want to see it engage, I'm going to ask my partner to just simply raise his elbow up just a little bit off the table. Great. And there we can see a nice example of the infraspinatus right there, right in between those landmarks. Here we can see a bit of the teres major. Here's some of that posterior deltoid. And there we can see some of the fibers of the trapezius. You go ahead and relax. So I'm just going to set my fingers right in that triangle and roll across the fibers of the infraspinatus. It has a very different feel than the supraspinatus we were feeling before, which was a little more bulky and more malleable. Good. And I can follow this laterally, again, as it passes underneath the deltoid and becomes more tendinous right there. So there's our infraspinatus. Next to it is going to be the teres minor again. There you go. And for the teres minor, I'm going to just locate the lateral border of the scapula again. Just mark that out. And right along this pathway is going to be two teres muscles, the teres major and then just above it, the teres minor. 
Now the Terry's Major is going to be much larger as its name insinuates, and I can just get my fingers on that here on my partner, and then I'm going to leave my fingers just above it and roll across the small Terry's Minor. So the Terry's Minor sits between the Terry's Major and the Infraspinatus. And if I ask my partner to just laterally rotate his shoulder joint, just go ahead and press your hand, the back of your hand into mine, great. There we can see the Infraspinatus again contract, and right next to it is the small Terry's Minor. Now what's curious is, notice that the Terry's Major, it's not doing anything because it does not laterally rotate the humerus. But if I ask him to go the other way, go ahead and just medially rotate, wow, look who shows up. The teres major now definitely engages, but the infraspinatus and teres minor are relaxed. Good, so they're antagonists on rotation of the shoulder. So if we wanted to shorten the teres minor and infraspinatus, we can adduct the shoulder, and to lengthen them, we can abduct the shoulder like so. So lengthened and shortened. Good. So now for our fourth rotator cuff muscle, I'm going to turn my partner sideline to locate the subscapularis. The deep subscapularis, located on the scapula's anterior surface, is sandwiched between the subscapular fossa and serratus anterior muscle, with only a small portion of its muscle belly accessible. So here's what we're going to do. First, I'm just going to scoop up my partner's arm and just pull it forward, which brings the scapula off the rib cage like so, opening up the axilla or armpit. And what this affords is now I can sink my thumb into the axilla and access part of that anterior surface of the scapula. But in order to do that, I need to just avoid some of this tissue here, and that's the latissimus dorsi and the teres major. So instead of trying to sink my thumb through this tissue, I'm going to just put my thumb right here in front of it and then very slowly with my partner's breath just sink my thumb slowly into the axilla until I find myself bumping into the anterior surface of that scapula right about there. And if I just want to check if I'm on the muscle, I'm going to ask my partner to try to immediately rotate his shoulder. So I'm going to ask him to try to swing his hand this way. Great and relax, and do that about, oh, 20%. Great, just a nice small contraction in there. Underneath my thumb, I feel the subscapularis engage. Good, and relax. And also, while I'm here, I can explore moving the shoulder to get in even a little bit further. I'm gonna slowly bring my thumb out, and there we go. And now let's try to find this from a supine position. I can do pretty much the same thing. I'm going to just bring the arm up, hold it like so. I'm going to notice that all of this tissue here is the latissimus dorsi, part of that teres major. And I'm going to set my thumb right into that space. And then mobilizing the shoulder, I'm going to slowly sink my thumb into the axilla, just sort of following my partner's breath because this is someone's armpit, it's a little tender. And right there, I feel sort of a wall that is that anterior surface of the scapula. And if I ask my partner to try to immediately rotate his shoulder like that, great. Underneath my thumb is a very solid contraction, good and relaxed. And it's not really like a big tubular muscle or anything. It's more of like just a flat wall of muscle laying against the scapula, good. And that is another way you can access some of that subscapularis in a supine position. And finally, if we want to lengthen the subscapularis, I can laterally rotate the shoulder. And to shorten it, immediately rotate the shoulder. So lengthen and shorten. And there's some information to get you started to locating and palpating the four muscles that stabilize the glenohumeral joint, the rotator cuff muscles. The rhomboid muscles are located between the scapula and vertebral column. Named for their geometric shape, the major is larger than the minor. They have thin fibers that lie deep to the trapezius and are superficial to the erector spinae muscles. Do you remember geometry? 
There was that square that looked like it got blown in the wind and suddenly became a rhombus. Well, that's the shape of the muscles that we're going to locate. And we're going to begin by finding the bony landmarks that really outline the rhomboids on the body. First, I'm going to just scoop up my partner's shoulder and I'm going to find the medial border of the scapula. And that's really quite readily found right there, right along the path of my index finger. There's the spine of the scapula, there's the inferior angle, and right there is that medial border. So we've got the medial border, and then we've got the spinous processes of C7 to T5. Now, there's a lot of spinous processes, so where are those? Well, luckily, the spinous process of C7 is more pronounced than the surrounding ones, and it's found right at the base of the neck. So if I lay the flat of my fingers right here, right along the base of her neck, well, sure enough, there's a very prominent spinous process, and that's going to be C7. And then I can just systematically count down T1, there's a little gap, and then T2, T3, and T4, and T5. Great. So we've got the spinous processes of C7 to T5, and we've got the medial border. And you can see how my four fingertips form that rhombus shape where the rhomboids are located. So let's check it out. I'm going to just engage the muscle by putting my partner's hand in the small of her back and asking her to just try to lift her elbow up into my hand a little bit. Great. And as she does so, the rhomboids engage as they try to add up the scapula, pulling it closer to the spine. And right there, we have a nice example of the rhomboids filling in this space right here. And go ahead and relax. And if I palpate in this area, I'm going to palpate, first of all, through the superficial fibers of the trapezius. But if I roll my fingers perpendicular to the rhomboids, so I'm going to roll them this way, well, wow, sure enough, there's the very clear fibers of the rhomboid major and a little further superior, the rhomboid minor. But for palpatory purposes, just so you know, they're basically one muscle. So look at it that way. And now just to differentiate, notice that I'm not working my fingers into all of this deeper tissue. No, that's the erector spinae. So let's just take a moment to differentiate these. Here on top, nice and superficial, is the very thin fibers of the trapezius. Then working a little deeper, I can feel the fibers of the rhomboids, again, going this direction. And then if I work even deeper, I can feel the fibers of the erector spinae that are running in this direction vertically. Great. And that's going to be your rhomboid major and minor here on the upper back. And whoever said that geometry didn't have practical application in everyday life? The levator scapula is located along the lateral and posterior sides of the neck. Its inferior portion is deep to the upper trapezius. However, as the levator ascends the lateral side of the neck, its fibers come out from under the trapezius and become superficial. Its belly is approximately two fingers wide with fibers that naturally twist around themselves. Is it a neck muscle? Is it a shoulder muscle? Who knows? Let's find out. So my partner's prone, and let's just begin by seeing that muscle. There it is, running from that superior angle of the scapula all the way up to the side of the neck. Good. So I'm going to begin by just isolating that first landmark, the superior angle. And so there's the medial border of my partner's scapula, and there would be the superior angle. And if I'm not quite sure if that's part of the scapula or part of the ribcage, I can just passively shift the scapula up and down a little bit, and sure enough, that tip right there moves with me. From that point, the levator passes underneath the trapezius to go here and attach at the transverse processes of the cervical vertebrae. And those I can just find right on the side of the neck. Notice I'm not back here on the posterior surface, not up here on the anterior lateral surface. I'm right on the side. And that's where I can find that sort of bony ridge formed by the TVP. One fun way to remember it is Frankenstein's bolt. Well, it was in one of his TVPs. And that's where the levator is going to attach. 
Now, if I want to see it engaged, I'm just going to ask my partner to try to elevate his scapula toward his ear. That's great, plenty. And here we have that edge of the trapezius, and I'm going to set my fingers just sort of in front of it, right there. And you can even see how my fingers sort of clunk across the fibers of the levator that is definitely engaged as he elevates his shoulder. Good. And go ahead and relax. And as he relaxes, so do those fibers. Those muscles are not engaged now. And I can follow it as it passes underneath the trapezius here, and I can follow it all the way to that superior angle. Good. So let's just take a moment and differentiate it from some of those surrounding muscles. Go ahead and raise your head slightly. Great. And here we have that edge of the trapezius, right here, kind of curling around. There's the levator passing underneath. Good, go ahead and relax. And here we have some of the scalenes just in front of the levator, which we'll have a better chance of seeing from a supine position. So let's do that now. So my partner's supine, and I'm just gonna scoop his head and locate that superior angle right there. It's just deep to those upper fibers of the trapezius, and I know that the levator is going to attach there and run up to the side of the neck here. And if I ask my partner to just try to shrug his shoulder up toward his ear a little bit, I can set my thumb right along that pathway, sure enough, and there's that levator scapula fibers engaging as they sort of penetrate from there all the way up to those TVPs of the cervicals. Good, and relax. So again, we've got the upper fibers of the trapezius here that come around the back of the neck, so that couldn't be the levator. I've got the splenius capitis. If you go ahead and just try to laterally flex your head, bringing your ear toward your shoulder, right here I can feel some of that splenius capitis that comes out from under the trapezius and attaches at the base of the head, so that couldn't be the levator because the levator attaches at the side of the neck. Go ahead and relax. And then here, just in front of where the levator is, go ahead and take a nice, slow, high, deep breath in your up. Great. Right there, I feel some of the posterior scalene, which is the muscle just in front of the levator. Good. And relax. And finally, if I want to lengthen the levator scapula on the side I'm palpating, I can laterally flex the head away. And to shorten it, I can laterally flex it to the same side. So, is it a neck muscle? Is it a shoulder muscle? Well, you guessed it, it's both. The pectoralis major is a broad, powerful muscle located on the chest. Except for the part beneath breast tissue, its convergent, superficial fibers are accessible. Pectoralis major is divided into three segments, the clavicular, sternal, and costal fibers. So my partner supine on the table, and I'm going to begin by engaging the pectoralis major. So go ahead and make a gentle fist and just press it into your hip. There you go. And so he's adducting the shoulder joint. And there we can see a fabulous example of the pectoralis major, fully superficial on the top of the chest. Good. Go ahead and relax. So with that in mind, let's find some key bony landmarks that help isolate the pectoralis major. So first, I'll find the clavicle here, just on the top of the chest, and I'll isolate that medial portion, which leads to the top of the sternum, and I can follow all the way down the surface of the sternum to about the line of the nipple or beyond there. And that is going to be the medial outline edge of where the pectoralis major attaches. And then I can follow those convergent fibers laterally to where they tuck underneath the deltoid and attach here on the anterior surface of the humerus at the crest of the greater tubercle of the humerus. Now this isn't going to be a bony landmark that you can readily isolate. It's a little difficult at first, but it's nice to know its general location here on the anterior surface of the humerus. Good. So now let's go ahead and engage the muscle again. Super. And so here we can see that outline of the muscle. There's the inferior edge. There's that superior edge, that deltopectoral groove that separates the pectoralis major from the anterior deltoid. And we can also even see some of those fibers converge that way. Good. Go ahead and relax. 
So now, with that in mind, I can reach in and really grasp a lot of this tissue that's the pectoralis major. Really lift this up off the rib cage. And it gets much thinner as you move medially toward the sternum. And as those fibers converge, it gets quite thicker here as it passes just beside the deltoid. Good. Now, if I wanted to shorten or lengthen the pec major, I can just abduct the shoulder up over the head and all of these fibers lengthen. And then to shorten the pectoralis major, I can just bring the arm forward into flexion and adduction. And all of those fibers become very shortened. Good. Go ahead and relax. Now that was relatively straightforward since my partner was a male. But the question arises, when palpating on a female, how do you access the pectoralis major and other muscles of the chest and axilla without contacting breast tissue? Well, let's show you how. So the first thing I'm going to do is just communicate my intentions to my partner. So Lynn, I'd like to access the pectoralis major, the muscle of the chest. Would that be all right with you? Yes. Okay. And if at any time you get uncomfortable or you want to stop, you just let me know. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my partner's in a supine position, which oftentimes the breast shifts laterally, which makes it much easier to access the sternal area in between the breasts right here, as well as the upper pectoral region underneath the clavicle here. But oftentimes in a supine position, large breasts will shift laterally and crowd the axilla. Well, we have two options. First, I can ask my partner, Lynn, would you be willing to just shift your breast medially away from the axilla? There we go, like so. And then I can position the arm and open up the axilla and access some of this tissue right here much more easily. Pectoralis major, pectoralis minor. The other thing I can do is I can just use the back of my hand like so to shift breast tissue out of the way and again access into the axilla. So those are just two things that you can do here with your partner supine. So in a sideline position, breast tissue often falls down toward the table away from the axilla and by just shifting the arm and scapula forward allows for much easier access of the axilla and the breast tissue is completely out of the way. The pectoralis minor lies next to the rib cage deep to the pectoralis major. Its fibers run perpendicular to the pectoralis major fibers from the scapula's coracoid process to the upper ribs. The major vessels serving the arm, the brachial plexus, axillary artery, and vein, cross underneath the pectoralis minor, creating the potential for neurovascular compression by this muscle. So let's begin by isolating a few of the key bony landmarks that really point out where the pectoralis minor is located. The first is going to be the coracoid process of the scapula, which I can easily find by locating that lateral portion of the clavicle there, and then just sliding inferior and using my broad finger pads right here. It's sort of like a little fingertip that points out right there. And that's where the pectoralis minor is going to attach and then run diagonally across the chest. And there we can see it just deep to the pectoralis major. Great. So we've got the coracoid process, and then it comes down and attaches to the third, fourth, and fifth ribs. Well, there's a lot of ribs, so how do we know which one's the third, fourth, and fifth? Here's how. I'm going to just locate the top of my partner's sternum right here, that manubrium, and then I'm going to just work my fingers down and about, oh, right there, about an inch, inch and a half down, there's a little speed bump in between the body of the manubrium and the sternum. And if I walk my fingers laterally a little bit, there's a rib right there. Well, right off that sternal notch, that little hump, is going to be the second rib. So if I know that this is the second rib, there's a little gap. That means this is the third rib, and there's a little gap. And there's the fourth rib, and a little gap, and there's the fifth rib. So we've got the fifth, fourth, and third rib right there. And if I just kind of walk my fingers laterally a little bit, I can just imagine that that, again, as we see it, is where the pectoralis minor is going to attach. So now that I have an idea of where the pectoralis minor is located, the question is, how am I going to access it? 
Well, I could just work right through the pectoralis major fibers here, but the pec major is pretty thick muscle. So instead, I'm going to go in through the side door of the axilla. So for that, I'm just going to passively abduct my partner's arm, and I'm going to locate that lateral edge of the pectoralis major right there. And if I'm not quite sure, go ahead and make a little fist and press it in your hip. Well, there we can really locate that lateral edge. So I'm going to set my thumb just in the axilla beneath that, and there's the surface of the ribs right there. And I'm going to very slowly, with my partner's breath, sink my thumb up into the pathway of where that pectoralis minor is going to be, right in there. And I feel the density of a small muscle that lays right next to the rib cage. And go ahead and just bring your shoulder down toward your hip. Great. And as he does so, a very small contraction. Underneath my thumb, I can feel that pectoralis minor engaging. Good. Go ahead and relax. And sure enough, there that muscle softens. And I can also scoop the elbow and just mobilize the shoulder a little bit to even shorten up some of this axilla and pec major tissue to work my thumb even a little deeper. And I'm working nice and softly and gently right in there. Good. Before I turn my partner sideline, to lengthen the pectoralis minor, I can scoop the shoulder and shrug the shoulder up and sort of round the scapula this way. And to shorten it, I can depress the scapula and bring the shoulder forward like so. So bringing these two attachments closer together or to lengthen them further apart. So now with my partner sideline, I'm going to just scoop the elbow and bring the arm and the scapula around the thorax like so. And what's great about this is it really opens up the axilla to access part of the pec minor. So I'm going to set my thumb right there along the side of the rib cage and just slowly descend right into that pathway of the pec minor, nice and soft and slowly. And if I ask my partner, go ahead and try to bring your shoulder down toward your hip so he depresses his scapula. There I can feel the edge of the pectoralis minor right along the rib cage engage. Great and relax. Good. And so another great way that you can access the pectoralis minor in a sideline position by getting your hands right in there in the axilla. The biceps brachii lies superficially on the anterior arm. It has a long head and a short head, which merge to form a long oval belly. So my partner seated off the side of the table. We could also do the supine. And I'll begin by asking my partner to engage his bicep brachii. Now, if you don't have a dumbbell, you can also just do resisted flexion of the elbow. And there, we can see a great example of the biceps here on the anterior arm. There we see that anterior edge of the deltoid. There we see a bit of the lateral edge of the brachialis. And while he holds it there, I'll just take a moment to actually get my hands on and feel that tubular shape as it forms into that distal tendon. Great. And go ahead and relax. Good. So now that the arm is relaxed, I'm going to just go ahead and see if I can get my fingers on this belly. Now notice, I'm not grasping all of this tissue on the anterior arm. No, that's going to be, there you go, the brachialis, which lays deep to the bicep. Take that away because we only want to see there, that, the bicep. And so I'm only looking to grasp that tubular shape. And there again is that soft distal tendon that sort of disappears into the antecubital space. And off of that, I can feel the bicipital aponeurosis here that forms over the flexors. And then I can go the other way and move proximally as the biceps passes underneath the deltoid. And at this point, the biceps, which as the name suggests, has two heads, but you really can't discern one from the other, except maybe up here. The long head of the bicep will pass underneath the deltoid to attach at that supraglenoid tubercle, while the short head is going to go at a different angle here 
to the coracoid process of the scapula. And that's a landmark we're going to want to isolate. I can find my partner's clavicle, and then if I just drop off the lateral end of the clavicle and roll my fingers broadly, I'll feel so it's sort of like a fingertip that I'm rolling my fingers across. And that's the coracoid process of the scapula, where the short head of the biceps attaches. And finally, I can shorten the biceps by supinating the forearm, flexing the elbow, and flexing the shoulder. And to lengthen it, I can do just the opposite. I can pronate the forearm, extend the elbow, and extend the shoulder. Great. And that is your biceps brachii there on the anterior arm. The triceps brachii is the only muscle located on the posterior arm. It has three heads, the long, lateral, and medial. The medial head is buried beneath the lateral and long heads, and aside from its proximal portion, which is deep to the deltoid, the triceps brachii is superficial and easily accessible. The great thing about the triceps brachii is it's pretty much the only muscle on the posterior arm. So if you're accessing and exploring any of this tissue, you're on the triceps. So let's begin by engaging it. I'm just going to ask my partner to try to straighten her elbow a little bit. So she's going to try to extend, just press against my hand. That's great. And there we can see how all of the triceps really engages. We've got that common tendon coming down to the olecranon process. And then there we've got that long head. And there's the lateral head and the medial head being deep to it. And there, of course, is the posterior edge of the deltoid. Good. So go ahead and relax. So I'm going to just set my hands right here in this tissue and just grasp and lift all of this. And this is all of the triceps. And if I ask my partner, just go ahead and try to straighten your elbow again. There I can really feel the long head engage here. And then over here we've got that lateral head. And then there's this flat surface right here, and that's sort of the tendon where all of these bellies attach to and I can follow it down as it becomes very taut and attach here at the elbow. Good. And so now that she's relaxed I can really sink my fingers into this tissue and feel the sort of the density of that tendinous attachment. Good. So we've got three bellies that come down and attach at that common tendon. Now let's explore the one head that actually crosses the shoulder joint. That's that long head here, and it's going to come all the way up and attach at the infraglenoid tubercle of the humerus. Now, where, where's that? Well, it's going to be right here at the top of the lateral border of the scapula. So I'm just going to set my fingers right here and find the lateral border of her scapula. And as I walk my fingers up a little bit, I'm going to pass deep to the deltoid, and right there is where the infraglenoid tubercle, where that tendon, is going to attach. Now, it's not like a big bump or anything like the coracoid process. It's more of just a landmark. And then if I ask her to try to raise her elbow a little bit, great. There I can see the teres major engage. And there's the posterior fibers of the deltoid. So I'm just going to set my thumb right in here and relax. And there I can roll across a very skinny tendon. It's like pencil width that runs from here right up to that infraglenoid tubercle. And I'm pretty sure that's not the deltoid because the deltoid fibers are going to go this way. And I know it's not the teres major and minor, which it actually penetrates, because they're going to go this way. No, this tendon that I feel right there is going this way. And if I ask her to go ahead and try to raise your elbow again, which engages it, yep, that tendon really becomes taut. So that's the tendon of your long head here that crosses the shoulder joint. And finally, if I want to shorten the triceps brachii, I can very simply extend the elbow like so. And if I want to lengthen it, I can flex the elbow. The brachialis is a strong elbow flexor that lies deep to the biceps brachii on the anterior arm. Portions of brachialis are accessible 
with its lateral edge being superficial and palpable. The next time you're on a flight, I encourage you to just lean over to the person next to you and just begin palpating and exploring for the brachialis muscle. It doesn't matter if you know them or not. Just give it a try. But I guess in order to do that, we should probably show you how, first of all. So I'm going to shake hands with my partner. And the brachialis can be a little bit elusive because it sits underneath the biceps brachii muscle. And what I'm going to do is just outline an edge right here along the lateral side of the arm from the deltoid tuberosity to the inner elbow. And if I ask my partner just to go ahead and try to flex your elbow a little bit, great. Here we can see the biceps brachii belly right there. Deep to that is going to be the brachialis, and right along that edge here is going to be the edge of the brachialis. So I'm going to set my thumb right there and go ahead and relax. And do you see how my thumb sort of clunks across the belly right there and there? That is that palpable, superficial edge of the brachialis, and that's the edge of the muscle that sort of bulges out the side of the arm right there. And I know this isn't the triceps because the triceps is on the posterior surface of the arm, but that right there is that palpable edge of brachialis. Now, I could try to find it on the medial surface of the arm, but there's some blood vessels and it gets a little bit tricky. And if I want to just engage it a little bit specifically, I'm going to pronate my partner's forearm and say, try to bring your hand toward your shoulder. So as he flexes his elbow, the biceps is less engaged because the forearm is pronated, but there's that edge of the brachialis right there, very clearly palpable. Great, and go ahead and relax. And finally, to shorten the brachialis, we can flex the elbow, and to lengthen it, we can extend the elbow. The brachioradialis is superficial on the lateral side of the forearm. It has a long oval belly that forms a helpful dividing line between the flexors and extensors of the wrist and hand. It is the only muscle that runs the length of the forearm but does not cross the wrist joint. So let's begin by engaging the brachioradialis. I'm going to ask my partner to just make a little fist, and I'm going to give him some resistance. Try to bring your hand toward your shoulder. Right. So he's trying to flex the elbow, and there we can see a great example of the brachioradialis popping out of the top of the forearm. You can even see where it becomes sort of tendinous here at the halfway point. Great, and relax. So the brachioradialis is going to originate here at that lateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus and then pass straight down the top of the forearm. So I can really set my fingers right on it. And if I get lost or I can't find it again, go ahead and just try to flex your elbow a little bit. Great. And again, it pops right out. And I can follow it all the way down the top of the forearm. And again, about there, I sort of lose it. It becomes a very thin tendon before it attaches here at the end of the radius. Good. And if I wanted to shorten the brachioradialis, I can flex the elbow. To lengthen it, I can extend the elbow. Great. And relax. So in the following scene, we're going to locate two major muscle groups of the forearm, the flexors and extensors of the wrist and fingers. But before we do that, let's just work on differentiating those two groups. So my partner seated, and I'm just going to position the forearm like so. So the forearm's not supinated or pronated, just sort of in neutral. And the flexors as a group are going to be located here on the medial side of the forearm, while the extensors are here on the lateral side of the forearm. And luckily for us, we've got two structures that serve as dividing lines that separate those two major groups. The first is going to be the brachioradialis. I'm just going to ask my partner to make a fist and try to bring your hand toward your shoulder. So she's flexing the elbow. And as she does, this muscle right here on the top of the forearm pops out. And that's her brachioradialis spanning all the way down the top of the forearm. And that's going to serve as our first dividing line between the flexors and the extensors. Good. And relax. And our second dividing line is going to be the shaft of the ulna right here. Runs all the way from the olecranon process, totally superficially, all the way down 
to this landmark, the head of the ulna. And that entire span of bone is our second dividing line because it separates the flexors over here and the extensors over here. And so those two structures are what we're really going to keep in mind when we go to these next segments. There are four extensors of the wrist and fingers. They are situated between the brachioradialis and the shaft of the ulna along the forearm's lateral and posterior surface. All of these muscles are superficial and accessible, though challenging to truly isolate. Extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis are lateral and posterior to the brachioradialis. Extensor carpi ulnaris, as its name suggests, lies along the ulnar shaft. And extensor digitorum is located between these muscles and has four long superficial tendons stretching along the dorsal surface of the hand and fingers. The extensors of the wrist and fingers, less bulky than the flexors, more sinewy. Let's see if we can get a handle on that. I'm going to begin by just isolating the two structures that separate the extensors from the flexors. The first is going to be the brachioradialis. So go ahead and make a fist and try to bring your hand toward your shoulder. And there, right there on the top of the forearm, we see the brachioradialis. That's that one structure that's going to separate these muscles from those. And then relax. And then on the underside of the arm, we have the shaft of the ulna running from the olecranid process all the way down to the head of the ulna. And a very superficial ridge. So we've got the shaft of the ulna and the brachioradialis, and in that space will be the extensors. So let's see these muscles engaged. I'm going to ask my partner to just go ahead and extend the wrist. Wow, and there's a great example of the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. And then next to it, we have the extensor digitorum. And then last, right next to the shaft of the ulna, we have the extensor carpi ulnaris. Good, and relax. So let's begin by just isolating the key bony landmarks where all of these extensors attach. And that's going to be right here at that lateral epicondyle of the humerus. So it's right here on the lateral side of the elbow, very prominent. And secondly, the lateral supracondylar ridge right here, just up from that epicondyle. Good. And so those landmarks will be where all of these extensors attach before they come down and insert into the wrist and fingers. Good. So let's begin with the two that are right next to the brachioradialis, the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis muscles. Go ahead and try to flex your elbow again. Great. So there's his brachioradialis. And I'm just going to set my thumb right next to the edge. And go ahead and relax. And right there is the tissue of the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. And go ahead and just try to swing your hand this way. Great. And as he tries to abduct the wrist, I can feel these bellies really engage. And they become somewhat tendinous about halfway down the forearm before they finally attach here at the bases of the metacarpals. Good and relax. So we've got the brachioradialis the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis, and then we have the digitorum. And if I ask my partner, just try to act like you're typing a little bit, playing on the piano. Wow, there we can really see the undulating effects of the digitorum right there. So I'm going to just set my thumb right into that space, and I can follow it proximally to that lateral epicondyle, and then I can roll my thumb across it. And go ahead and type again. Oh, yeah, this is really interesting, engaged, very much engaged tissue right here. Good, and relax. And then about right here, that muscle belly gives away to tendons and passes down the back of the wrist where it finally attaches at the end of the fingers. And last but not least, after the digitorum, we have the extensor carpi ulnaris. And if you're not quite sure where it is, you can always even start at the shaft of the ulna right there and work your fingers over, and that large, bulky belly is the ulnaris. And I'm going to ask my partner to just swing your hand that way. That's right. So he's adducting at the wrist, and there we can feel and even see 
that ulnaris engage. And there we see its distal tendon passing by the wrist. Great and relax. So finally, we can shorten the extensors by extending the wrist and extending the fingers. And then I can lengthen them by flexing the fingers and flexing the wrist. Go. There are five muscles that create flexion at the wrist or fingers. They're located on the forearm's anterior and medial surface between the brachioradialis and the ulnar shaft. Most of the flexors originate as one mass from the common flexor tendon at the medial epicondyle of the humerus. And the flexors are arranged in three layers. The superficial layer is formed by the long bellies of flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus, and flexor carpi ulnaris. All three are palpable. The middle and deeper layers contain the wide bellies of flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus, respectively. So since the forearm is packed with over 15 different muscles, five of them being the flexors of the wrist and fingers, let's take this step by step. I'm going to begin by just isolating the two structures that divide the flexors here on the medial side of the forearm from the extensors. And the first is going to be that brachioradialis muscle we see there on the top of the forearm. Go ahead and make a little fist and try to bring your hand toward your shoulder. Great. So as he tries to flex his elbow, there we can really see the brachioradialis pop out on the top of the forearm. So that's one dividing line. The second dividing line is going to be the shaft of the ulna here, running all the way from the head of the ulna all the way down superficially to the elbow. And all of this tissue in between those two structures is going to be the flexors. Good. So if I want to see these muscles engaged, go ahead and just curl your fingers and then curl your wrist. Sort of flex your forearm there a little bit. Great. And all of this tissue here, really very contracted now, now that he's flexing the wrist and the fingers, that's going to be the flexor group right there. Great. Go ahead and relax. And I can really get my fingers on it now. Very fleshy, muscular group, unlike the extensors, which were more sinewy. Great. Very, very pliable and malleable. So unlike the extensors, which are arranged in a side-by-side -side pattern, the flexors are arranged in three layers. The first layer is going to be comprised of that flexor carpi radialis, in the middle the palmaris longus, and then over here on the ulnar side is the flexor carpi ulnaris. And they make up that first superficial layer. And if we take those away, we can see the middle layer, which is the flexor digitorum superficialis, and deep to that is the flexor digitorum profundus. So those are our three layers of the flexors. Well, let's go back to that superficial layer for a moment. So the bulk of this tissue of the flexors is comprised of that second and third layer. So the three superficial ones are not very big and span right across the top of the forearm and penetrate into the hand. And the easiest way to get your hands on one of those muscles or tendons is right here at the wrist where these muscles are very thin tendons. So if I ask my partner, just go ahead and try to like squeeze a basketball. There you go. Do you see that tendon right there, right in the middle, sort of running right into the middle of the wrist? That's the palmaris longus. That's that one that was in the middle. And then go ahead and relax. And if you just try to abduct your wrist a little bit going that way, do you see this tendon here? That's going to be the flexor carpi radialis. And then go the other way. And as he adducts his wrist, here is the tendon of the flexor carpi ulnaris. Great. And those three tendons can be a great jumping off point to access the bellies themselves. So let's do that. So go ahead and relax your forearm there. There's that flexor carpi radialis tendon. And as I follow it proximally, it's really quite small. It's not a very thick, round belly. It's sort of uh, flat, in a sense. And if I ask my partner again to just try to abduct your wrist a little bit, that's great. There, that muscle really engages. And I can follow it all the way down as it descends and attaches to the medial epicondyle. Great. So that's the flexor carpi radialis. And then in the middle, we've got that palmaris longus. 
and there again it becomes more muscular. And go ahead and do that palming of a basketball again. Ah, now as he tenses his palmaris longus, this belly really engages right there. And again, it's heading right to that medial epicondyle. Good, and relax. And last, we've got that tendon right here, which is the flexor carpi ulnaris. It attaches here at the pisiform, that little tiny carpal bone right at that flexor crease. And then I'm going to just follow it proximally. And go ahead and shift your wrist the other way. I'll give him a little resistance. So he's going to try to adduct going the, there you go, that way. And sure enough, as he tries to adduct his wrist, that belly really engages. Now what's interesting to notice is that this belly right here does not lay next to the shaft of the ulna, which is here. There's like a little gap right here, right along the shaft of the ulna. We're going to get to that in just a moment. So we've got three superficial flexors running down the front of the forearm, and then the next layers, the flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus, are really going to make up most of this tissue, like I was saying. And if I ask my partner, just try to type slowly with your fingers a little bit so as he tries to flex his digits. Wow, I can really feel the undulating quality of these deeper flexors underneath my fingers right there. Great, relax. And so all of that mass under there is going to be these deeper flexors. And remember that gap that was right next to the shaft of the ulna? Well, if I set my fingers right on the edge of that ulna and then sink into the flexor area there, and then go ahead and type a little bit more. And as he tries to wiggle his fingers, wow, that's really like a great side door to access some of the flexors right there. You can really feel the profundus and digitorum as they contract and relax as he does that. That's great and relax. Good. So finally, if I want to shorten the flexors, I can passively flex the digits and the wrist and the elbow. And to lengthen all of these, I can extend the elbow extend the wrist, and extend the fingers. So to lengthen and then to shorten. Great. And that's just a little bit of something to get you started on the flexors of the wrist and fingers. Located on the anterior surface of the forearm, the round pronator teres is located between the brachioradialis and the forearm flexors. It is partially superficial and the only muscle in this vicinity with oblique fibers. So let's begin by seeing where the pronator teres is on the forearm. I'm just going to open up my partner's forearm here like so, supinating it, and there we can see where the pronator teres is passing along that medial side of the forearm. Great. Now in order to find that path exactly, here's what I want to do. I'm going to locate that distal tendon of the bicep. So go ahead and just try to bring your hand toward your shoulder a little bit. Great. And as he tries to flex his elbow, there I can find that distal tendon of the bicep as it seems to just penetrate into the antecubital space. Good. And relax. And from there, I'm just going to move my thumb a little distal and a little medial, and I'm going to find my thumb right along the pathway of the pronator teres. And sure enough, there's my thumb just clunking across its belly right there. And I'm going to ask him to go ahead and just try to pronate your forearm a little bit. I'm going to give him a little resistance. And wow, that muscle belly, it's about finger wide, definitely engages. And it seems to sort of head this way, passing underneath the brachioradialis. Good. Go ahead and relax. So how do I know, though, that this belly isn't one of the flexors here running down to the wrist? Well, let's see. This belly that I'm feeling heads up toward the medial epicondyle. Now, that doesn't help, though, because all the flexors head that way as well. But if I follow it distally, it's heading to here, to that shaft of the radius right here. You go ahead and pronate again. Yep, that belly ends right about here. So it couldn't be a flexor because those flexors are coming all the way down here. There you can see all those distal tendons. So that's just one way you can tell if you're on a pronator or a flexor. And finally, if I want to shorten the pronator teres, I can pronate the forearm and flex the elbow. And to lengthen it, I can extend and supinate. So shortening by flexing and pronating, 
and lengthening by supinating and extending. The erector spinae group runs from the sacrum to the occiput along the posterior aspect of the vertebral column. The erector spinae muscles are like a tall poplar tree with three main branches. In this case, the spinalis, longissimus, and iliocostalis. The spinalis is the smallest of the three muscles and lies closest to the spine in the lamina groove. The thick longissimus and lateral iliocostalis form a visible mound along the lumbar and thoracic spine. The long tendons of iliocostalis extend laterally beneath the scapula. So the erector spinae, those broad muscles that run right up the entire spine. Let's see if we can find them. I'm going to begin by asking my partner to just raise his feet a little bit. That's fabulous, right there. Now, the erectors don't obviously raise the feet, but they stabilize the pelvis when I ask him to do this action, and there we can see really fine example of the lower portion of the erector spinae engaging as he does that. And notice when I ask him to relax, they soften and seem to disappear. Now, to engage the upper fibers, I'll ask my partner to just sort of arch his back a little bit. There you go. And there we can see deep to those middle fibers of the trapezius, the upper portion of the erector spinae right there. Great. Go ahead and relax and they seem to soften and disappear. Great. Now, there's probably only one key bony landmark or landmarks that's going to help really get your hands on the erectors, and that's going to be the spinous processes of the thoracic and lumbar vertebrae. They run, of course, right down the center of the spine, and I can just set my fingers on those like so. If there's any other landmarks, I'd have to say it would be the PSI cis, the posterior superior iliac spines, where those dimples are often found in the low back. And then lastly, probably the surface of the sacrum right here, which is where a lot of the erectors attach onto, right onto that tissue, into the thoracolumbar aponeurosis. Good. So what I'm going to do is just set my fingers next to the spinous processes and see if I can work my fingers into those erectors. Now, since I know that they run up the spine, I know that the fiber direction is going to run this way. So I'm going to purposefully roll my fingers across the fibers and really get a sense of their fibers and their density, really quite large here in the lumbar area. And as I progress superiorly, they become a little broader and a little more tendinous, sort of thinning out a little bit. Here I'm working underneath those lower fibers of the trapezius. Now there's three branches of the erector spinae. The most uh, medial, closest to the spinous processes, will be the smaller branch of the three, which will be the spinalis, right in here, right in that lamina groove. And then if I take it a step further lateral, I'm going to roll across the longissimus fibers, and then the most lateral will be the iliocostalis right out here, which has those tendons that come here almost spreading right underneath the scapula. Great. And finally, let's just check to make sure we're on the muscles we think we're on. If I ask my partner to just raise his feet up a little bit, I want to see if these muscles engage, and they do. Great. Go ahead and relax. Do these fibers run vertically up the spine? Yes, they do. And if I move up into the thoracic area here, beneath the superficial trapezius and then the intermediate rhomboid fibers, deep to those there, I can feel the fibers of the erector spinae. And those are just all ways that you can check to make sure that you're really feeling the erector's down the entire back.
The multifidi and rotatories are part of the transversospinalis muscle group. They are deep to the erector spinae muscle group and extend the length of the vertebral column. The surprisingly thick multifidi are directly accessible in the lumbar spine. They are the only muscles with fibers that lie across the posterior surface of the sacrum. And the shorter, smaller rotatories lie deep to the multifidi. So to palpate the multifidi and the rotatories, I'm going to first isolate the lamina groove. So the lamina groove is that space that's in between the spinous processes and the transverse processes of the lumbar and thoracic vertebrae. And there you can see the vertebrae and that trough that's on either side of the spinous processes. Those are the lamina grooves. And that's where we're going to find the multifidi and the rotatories deep to the erectors. So let's just begin by getting a sense of where those landmarks are. Well, the spinous processes are pretty easy to find. They're usually running right up the center of the back. And there I can just easily feel a series of points that are the spinous processes. Here we can feel the thoracic spinous processes. I can even just roll my fingers around them on either side, little spaces in between them. And then as we move into the lumbar area, I notice that they're a little further apart because the vertebrae are larger. And I can follow them all the way down here to that surface of the sacrum. So we've got the spinous processes, and then we've got the transverse processes that are quite a bit more difficult to locate because they're deep. And the distance between the transverse processes is going to change because in the lumbar area, obviously the vertebrae are larger, so the TVPs are further lateral. But as we ascend the spine, the TVPs get closer to the spinous processes as the vertebrae get smaller in size. So let's first locate the lumbar TVPs. I'm going to just locate the spinous processes here and then slide over those large erector spinae muscles and then just kind of come in through the side door here laterally and feel for the bony ridge that's formed by the TVPs of the lumbar right there. So I'm sort of going in that direction. And I'm in between the iliac crest and the 12th rib, and there's the TVPs right there. So I know that in that space is going to be the location of the rotatories and multifidi. So then I can follow that up, again, not working through the erectors, but just off to the side. And there we can continue to feel the TVPs as they lay next to the rib cage now, right there. So if I slide a little lateral, that's the surface of the ribs right there. But if I tuck in just a little bit here underneath and so going in the side door of the erectors, there's those TVPs of the thoracic vertebrae. And I can follow this all the way up here into that region between the scapula. So what we've done there is isolate where the lamina groove is right in here. And now let's just take a moment to see those multifidi and rotatory. There they are as they sit right there in the lamina groove. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set my fingers here, right in the thoracic area. And I'm just going to very slowly work my fingers through the erector fibers to get down to that level of the multifidi and the rotatory. Now, I might not feel specific bellies, but I'm definitely going to feel the density of this muscle tissue as it sits in the lamina groove, right in there. And if I work a little further inferior here, deep to the erectors, I really have to work my fingers in through those deep, thick erector fibers. But there, in that lamina groove, is the density and mass of those multifidi and rotatories. And finally, I can move all the way down to the surface of the sacrum here. I can work right through the sheet, and I can feel the muscle tissue that sits right on top of that. And that's got to be the multifidi, because it's the only muscle that's found on the surface of the sacrum, right there. The eight small suboccipitals are the deepest muscles of the upper posterior neck. To outline the suboccipital's location, find the superior nuchal line of the occiput, the transverse processes of C1, and the spinous process of C2. The upper fibers of the trapezius can also be used as a marker. 
So when we say that the suboccipitals are the deepest muscles of the upper posterior neck, what exactly do we mean? Well, let's show you. First of all, if we look at the back of the neck, there we can see the most superficial muscle, and that's the trapezius. And then if we take that away, we can see the next layer, which is the splenius capitis. And then deep to that, we see the rather thick semispinalis capitis. And then finally, deepest of all, right there we see the suboccipitals. Eight little muscles tucked right in there at the base of the skull. Good. So now that we have an idea of generally where they're located, let's isolate some landmarks to really find their lo exact location. First, we've got the superior nuchal line of the occiput running right along here at the base of the head. Now, my partner's bald, which is convenient for me, but even if he had a big head of hair, I can locate it because it runs right across pretty much the top of the ear or the middle of the ear right here. And I can set my fingers right along that space, and there are those superior nuchal lines, one on this side, one on this side. And it's, they sort of serve as the shoreline between the bones of the cranium and the muscles of the neck. And there we see a really nice example of the external occipital protuberance. Okay, so that's one landmark that's going to help us. Not because the suboccipitals attach here. They actually attach about an inch and a half below. But that's a nice reference point to just start from. The second landmark is going to be the transverse processes of C1, which is located by finding the mastoid process here and then just slipping my finger inferiorly and anteriorly a little bit. And using the broad finger pads, I'm going to just feel for a deep bony knob right there. And right there and here on the other side, going to be the TVPs of C1, and that's going to be our second landmark to isolate the suboccipitals. And the last one will be the spinous process of C2. And there, I'm going to just set my finger pads here on the posterior neck. I'm probably about, oh, two, two and a half, three inches below the level of the external occipital protuberance. And right there is a subtle mound of the spinous process of C2 pretty easy to find since C1 doesn't have a spinous process. So we've got the spinous process of C2, the TVPs of C1, and there the superior nuchal lines. And all of those will serve as references for where we can find the suboccipitals. And again, we can see them right there. Okay, now if I wanted to get my hands on these muscles, instead of actually working my fingers through the trapezius and these deeper muscles here, I'm going to actually just ask my partner to raise his head slightly, and there I can find that edge of the trapezius right there, and relax, and I'm going to just set my fingers right there along the edge of the trapezius and work my fingers into this tissue. Now again, I don't feel any of the specific bellies of the suboccipitals, but as a mass, as a group, their mass and their density can definitely be felt right in there. And last but not least, I want to show you one thing that's interesting on my partner. Go ahead, just kind of tuck your chin a little bit. And here we have a great example of what runs in between the two sides of the suboccipitals and the other muscles of the neck, and that's the ligamentum nuchae, spanning from that external occipital protuberance down to the spinous process of C7. Just a really great example of that band of connective tissue that sort of spans right up the back of the neck. Good, go ahead and relax. So with that in mind, let's now turn our partner supine and see what we can find in that position. So with my partner in a supine position, there's a simple little maneuver I can do to access the suboccipitals. I'm gonna just cradle the head with my hands and I'm gonna find that superior nuchal line either side of that external occipital protuberance, that big knob on the back of the head. And then I'm gonna just slowly sink my fingers inferiorly down toward the suboccipitals. And as my fingers sort of descend into the back of the neck, sort of rounding and following the round surface of the cranium, there I'm going to just penetrate through those superficial muscle bellies, the trapezius and whatnot, and my fingers are going to find themselves 
sort of resting on the density of those suboccipitals. And that's just a little maneuver you can do to just let the weight of the head and the neck allow your fingers to sink right into these muscles. Although it would seem to be the deepest muscle of the low back, the quadratus lumborum is, strangely enough, the deepest muscle of the abdomen. Stretching from the posterior ilium to the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae and 12th rib, this squat muscle is simply an abdominal muscle located on the posterior surface of the thorax. So my partner's prone on the table, and I'm going to begin by isolating the three bony landmarks that really isolate the location of the quadratus lumborum. The first bony landmark is going to be the 12th rib, which is located at the very bottom of the rib cage, of course. And I can find the surface of the rib cage. And after a while, my fingers sink into the flesh of the posterior abdomen. And at the very bottom, if I go back a little bit, the very bottom of the rib cage, there is his 12th rib. And I can follow it medially to where it attaches here at the vertebrae. So first landmark is the 12th rib. Then we've got the posterior iliac crest. And there's his iliac crest. And I can follow it posteriorly to where it ends at the PSIS, that dimple of the low back. And then finally, the third bony landmark, or landmarks, will be the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae. So we know the spinous processes are here, and the transverse processes are going to be a good distance further lateral. So I'm going to set my fingers beyond the erector spinae and work my fingers at an angle, and there I can feel the bony ridge of the transverse processes. They're not like individual points, it's more like a ridge. Good. So now we've got the 12th rib, the posterior iliac crest, and the transverse processes. And in that space will be the quadratus lumborum. So let's check it. I'm going to just set my fingers into that space. I'm going to start laterally. And I'm going to ask my partner to go ahead and bring this hip toward this shoulder. Fabulous. And just a very small contraction, I can feel the QL contract. And go ahead and relax. Good. And now with the tissue relaxed, I can really get my finger into this space between the bottom of the rib cage and the top of the pelvis. Now, let's figure out where the erector spinae are in, in the midst of all this. Go ahead and raise your feet up slightly. Fabulous. And that action shows me where the erector spinae fibers are. And here's that lateral edge. And I know that there's the erectors, and the QL will be further lateral. Go ahead and relax. Good. And so I can avoid the erectors by getting right into this space for the quadratus lumborum. We can also access the quadratus lumborum in a sideline position. I can find that posterior iliac crest, I can find the bottom of the rib cage, and I can set my thumbs right into that space between those landmarks and ask my partner to go ahead and hike your hip just a pinch there. And there's that edge and contraction of the quadratus lumborum. The four abdominal muscles expand far beyond the stomach region. In fact, they form a muscular girdle that reaches around the sides of the thorax all the way to the thoracolumbar aponeurosis and superiorly to the middle ribs and inferiorly to the inguinal ligament. The revered washboard belly is formed by the multiple superficial bellies of the rectus abdominis. Lateral to the rectus abdominis is the external oblique. Unlike the round bellies of the rectus, the external oblique is a broad superficial muscle best palpated at its attachment to the lower ribs. The thin internal oblique fibers are deep and perpendicular to the external oblique fibers and can be difficult to distinguish. And lastly, the transverse abdominis, the deepest muscle of the group, plays a major role in forced exhalation and cannot be specifically palpated. So let's begin with the rectus abdominis, better known as the six-pack muscle, but in all reality, it's a ten-pack. So what I'm going to ask my partner to do is, just so we can see the muscle engaged, is go ahead and do a little bit of a crunch. So he's going to just flex his torso a little bit, and there we have a great example 
of the topography of that rectus abdominis here. And while he's just engaged, I'm just gonna set my fingers here and really isolate those individual bellies that extend all the way from the rib cage down to that pubic crest. Great, go ahead and relax. So let's just take this to the next step and just isolate some of the landmarks that help really shape where the rectus abdominis is. The first I'm gonna find is just that edge of the ribs right here. So above that is going to be this surface of the rib cage, surface of ribs five, six, and seven. There's his xiphoid process just at the bottom of the sternum. So on one end of the rectus, we've got this surface of the bottom portion of the rib cage, and down here we've got the pubic crest. Now, let's just stop here for a second. Chances are you've never palpated your own pubic crest, let alone your partner's, so let's all find it, you, me, and my partner. So first thing we're gonna do is just go ahead and locate your navel or your umbilicus right here. And then just progressively work your fingers down inferiorly and you'll feel flesh and flesh of the belly. And then there, about six or eight inches down, just above the pubic hairline, you'll feel a ridge of bone. And that's your pubic crest, okay? So now I'm gonna try to find it on my partner. Can I locate your pubic crest? Okay, so ask permission. So there's his umbilicus. There we just sort of press into the fibers of the rectus. And right about there, there's the ridge of his pubic crest. Did you do a little crunch again? Great, and there I can really feel the tendon of the rectus abdominis attach right there. Good, go ahead and relax. And it gives you an idea of how the rectus abdominis sort of tapers as it comes down the abdomen like so. So now that the belly's relaxed, I'm just gonna sort of work my fingers into this belly here. And you can even take both sides and gently grasp them and sort of lift them up a little bit. Great, and here is that lateral edge of the rectus, which is where I can feel the rectus abdominis, and on the other side is the external oblique. So speaking of which, let's see if we can find that. So the external oblique is that broad sheet of muscle here on the side of the torso. And we sometimes think that it's like just here. But no, if you really look at it for a moment, and there we can see it, it spans all the way from this edge of the rectus around the side of the torso and all the way back here to the thoracolumbar aponeurosis. And of course, deep to the external oblique is the internal oblique. So there we can see that running in perpendicular direction to the externals. And then of course, deep to those two are the transverse abdominis fibers. So we've got three broad sheets of muscle that really coat and cover this entire side of the abdomen. So if I wanna see the external oblique contract, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna ask my partner to just bring this shoulder toward this hip. Great, so he does a crunch and he kind of rotates shortening these fibers right here, which are the external obliques. And all of this surface here, you can see where it interdigitates with the serratus anterior right there. And all of those fibers you can really see come all the way down to that iliac crest to here at the edge of the rectus. Good, and relax. Deep to that, we have the internal obliques running again perpendicularly. And so to engage this side of the internal obliques, I'm gonna have him bring this shoulder toward this hip. And so all of these fibers shorten and deep to the external obliques, which still contract a little bit for this motion, but deep to those right in here, we can feel those internal oblique fibers right there, great, and relax. And then finally, of course, we've got the transverse abdominis deep to those, which is pretty much unpalpable, but if you're grasping some of this tissue on the side of the thorax right here in between the bottom of the ribs and the iliac crest, you know that you're accessing the transverse abdominis as well. Good. Okay, reality check. Chances are that your partner's not gonna have ripped abs like my previous partner. Most people don't, I certainly don't. And the question arises, when the abdomen doesn't give you any visual clues because it's covered with a layer of adipose tissue, how do you locate the abdominal muscles? Well, I'll give you a hint. A little help from your bony landmarks. So let's give it a try. The bony landmarks that really get me in line with the rectus abdominis. Do you remember what they were? That's right. First, I'm gonna just find that bottom edge 
of the rib cage right here. That's not where the rectus attaches, but it's a really good place to start. And I can follow it right up to the xiphoid process. And if I walk laterally a little bit, there's that surface of those fifth, sixth, and seventh ribs right there. Good. So the muscle comes down the front of the abdomen here somewhere and attaches at that pubic crest. So can I palpate your pubic crest? Yes. Great. So there's his navel, and I'm just going to work through some of this tissue here all the way down, and there is that pubic crest. Great. Now, if you go ahead and do a little crunch, great. And just hold it there for a second. Now, we can't see any of those ripped bellies of the rectus abdominis, but if I set my fingers right on this tissue and work through some of the adipose, there I can definitely feel some of those bellies of the rectus. And here, if I come over to the side, I can really sense the edge of that muscle. Good. Go ahead and relax. Good. So even though I couldn't see any of the rectus abdominis like I saw before, I know just by using bony landmarks and a sense of where that muscle is and visualizing it, that's where my rectus is going to be. And then if I come over here to the side, I again can find that bottom edge of the rib cage, knowing that those obliques are going to cover this portion of the ribs here, all of the space between the ribs and that iliac crest. Let me see if I can find that. There's that iliac crest coming around the side of the torso here. And then if I ask my partner, go ahead and try to bring this shoulder toward this hip, great. And all of this tissue, yes, deep to the adipose tissue is definitely engaged. A very nice solid wall of muscle. Good and relax. And then when he relaxes, I can work my fingers in and deep to this adipose and feel those obliques. So the lesson here is that you don't need to have ripped abs in order to locate the abdominals. You can do it even through adipose tissue and clothing and whatnot. The sternocleidomastoid, or SCM, is located on the lateral and anterior aspects of the neck. It has a large belly with two heads, a flat clavicular head and a slender sternal head. Both heads merge to attach behind the ear at the mastoid process. So since the sternocleidomastoid, or SCM, is so superficial and easily visible, let's begin by engaging it. I'm going to just rotate my partner's head a little bit to the opposite side and ask him to just raise his head off my hand just a pinch. Fabulous. So he's flexing the neck and there we can see a fabulous example of the sternocleidomastoid on the side and the anterior surface of the neck. Good. Go ahead and relax. Now there are three bony landmarks that are going to help us isolate where the SCM is. The first is going to be the mastoid process. It's located right here, right behind the back of the earlobe. I just set my fingers on that very large portion of bone right here at the base of the head. And so the sternocleidomastoid is going to attach there and come down to attach at that medial portion of the clavicle here. And then the very top of the manubrium right there. And if I ask him to go ahead and raise your head slightly, fabulous. There we can see that sternal head, this very skinny tendon attached right to the top of the manubrium. And here we can see that broader clavicular head attached to the clavicle. And then both heads ascend up the neck to attach to the mastoid. Good. Go ahead and relax. So to get my fingers on this muscle, I can really just grasp and use sort of a pincer palpation to just lift up the SCM here all the way up to the mastoid and all the way down to that clavicle there. Now, let's take a moment to notice something. Passing underneath the medial side of the sternocleidomastoid is the carotid artery. So let's figure out exactly where that is so that when we're grasping the SCM, we don't, well, pinch off the blood flow to our partner's head. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just set my finger right along the medial portion of that SCM 
and sure enough, there's the really strong pulse of the carotid artery. And it runs and passes right up along that medial edge. If I'm grasping the SEM and I feel that pulse underneath my finger, just release and readjust. Finally, to shorten the SEM, I can rotate the head to the opposite side. And you can see where the attachment sites get closer together. And to lengthen it, I can rotate the head to the same side. And there you can see where these attachment sites and the attachment site here at the base of the head get further apart. So we can shorten it by rotating to the opposite side and lengthen it by rotating to the same side. The three scalene muscles are sandwiched between the sternocleidomastoid and the anterior flap of the trapezius on the anterior lateral side of the neck. The anterior scalene lies partially tucked beneath the SEM, while the middle scalene is slightly larger and lies lateral to the anterior scalene. Both muscle bellies are directly accessible. And the smaller posterior scalene is located between the middle scalene and the levator scapula muscle. The large branches of the brachial plexus and subclavian artery pass through a small gap between the anterior and middle scalenes. So let's isolate the structures that really pinpoint where the scalenes are located. First, we've got the SCM, then the edge of the trapezius, and then the clavicle. These three form what's known as the posterior triangle of the neck. And if I set my fingers right into that space and ask my partner to take a nice deep breath into the upper lungs, great. And there, underneath my fingers, I feel the strong, ropey muscles of the scalenes. Great, go ahead and relax. So I'm gonna keep my fingers here and isolate two of the three bony landmarks that help isolate where the scalenes are. First is gonna be the first rib. First rib starts here, passes under the clavicle, like so. And I can set my fingers into this space and feel the surface of the first rib right there. And that's where the anterior and middle scalene are going to attach. Then, if I shift a little more lateral, I'll find the surface of the second rib, and that's where the posterior scalene attaches. Good. The third landmark, or landmarks, will be the TVPs of the cervical vertebrae, which I'm going to find right here on the lateral side of the neck, just underneath the SEM. So I'm just kind of rolling my fingers across that ridge formed by the TVPs. So now let's just see if we can find the anterior scalene. Go ahead and raise your head a little bit. There we can see the edge of the SEM and I'm going to leave my finger right there. Go ahead and relax. And that there is the anterior scalene belly. Now the SEM runs in this direction but the anterior scalene is going to go in that direction. And go ahead and take another high deep breath. And that muscle clearly contracts. And I can follow it as it passes underneath the SCM to attach on the TVPs. OK, and relax. Now next to the anterior scalene will be the middle scalene. And there I can feel the belly of the middle scalene. And this now is going to head sort of in that direction. And then if I continue one step further, a little deeper into the neck will be the posterior scalene. And go ahead and take another deep breath. Sure enough, this smaller, probably the smallest of all scalenes, definitely contracts and relax. And it's going to head out in this direction, pretty much straight lateral. Now, how do I know that I haven't overstepped my palpation and gone from the anterior to the middle to the posterior to the next muscle around the neck, which would be the levator scapula? Well, there's a little test we can do to find out. The levator scapula helps elevate the scapula, but the posterior scalene doesn't. So if I set my fingers on what I believe to be the posterior scalene right there, and I ask my partner, go ahead and elevate your scapula. There you go, kind of bring your shoulder up towards your ear. Fabulous. This muscle I'm palpating, it's loose. It's relaxed. Nothing's happening. And go ahead and relax. So it's not engaged. So that must be the posterior scalene. 
And just for fun, if I slide a little further posterior and ask my partner to go ahead and raise your scapula, this muscle, the next muscle in line, definitely contracts, and that's your levator scapula. So a little trick to kind of discern exactly which muscle you're on. Go ahead and relax. Finally, we can lengthen the scalings by laterally flexing the head to the opposite side like so, and we can shorten them by laterally flexing the head to the same side. The masseter is the strongest muscle in the body relative to its size. It is composed of two overlapping bellies. The superficial belly can be accessed from the face. The deeper belly is palpable from inside the mouth. The masseter is situated deep to the parotid gland, yet is easily palpable. So the masseter, strong enough to bite off a human finger. But we're not going to do that today. Instead, we're just going to chew a little bit of gum. I gave my partner a big old piece of hubba bubba, and there you can really see the masseter on the side of the mandible really engaged. And go ahead and just clench for a moment. And there you can even see some of the muscle fibers running this way vertically up to the zygomatic arch. Great, go ahead and keep chewing. There, just behind the eyebrow, we can see some of the temporalis as it sort of dimples the side of the head there. And what's really interesting is that you've got two masseters and two temporalis muscles contracting constantly all day long and putting terrific strain right here on that small little temporomandibular joint right there, four to 6,000 times a day. Well, let's lay our partner supine and we'll palpate from there. So my partner supine, and I'm gonna locate some of the landmarks that isolate where the masseter is located. First is going to be this edge of the mandible right there. There's the angle of the mandible and it comes up this way. So right along there. And then we've got the zygomatic arch running right along here. And that portion of the cheekbone, I can even roll my fingers across right here. Well, in between this span of bone and that span of bone, as we can see right there, will be the masseter. And if I ask my partner to go ahead and just clench your jaw a little bit, wow, there's a very clear rectangle of muscle that spans from here on the mandible all the way up to that zygomatic arch. Good, go ahead and relax. And what I can do is I can just set my thumb right on that tissue and feel for the fibers of the masseter. Now, I'm gonna be working through the parotid gland, so just something to be aware of. And then if I ask my partner to clench again, wow, that tissue really engages. Here, I can even feel that anterior edge of the masseter as she engages, and as she relaxes, it seems to disappear. So all of that chunky mass of tissue right here on the side of the jaw is gonna be the masseter right there. Finally, if I wanted my partner to lengthen her masseter, I could ask her to just open your mouth. And if I wanted to shorten it, I could ask her to close her mouth. The temporalis muscle is located on the temporal aspect of the cranium. Its broad origin attaches to the frontal, temporal, and parietal bones. Its fibers converge in a thick mass, reaching underneath the zygomatic arch to connect at the coronoid process of the mandible. So the temporalis, it's not so much that we use it every day, it's that we use it several times every minute, talking and clenching and chewing. It's like my partner here. I just gave him a big old piece of gum, and there's a great shot of the masseter, that square muscle here on the jaw, and our muscle right now, the temporalis, right here on the side of the head. You can see how the converging fibers come down pass underneath that zygomatic arch. What's really interesting is if you watch mastication or chewing, you'll notice that it's not just elevation and depression of the mandible. No, it takes some lateral deviation and some protraction and retraction as well. It's really all motions. And it just gives you a little bit of an idea of the pressure and the work that is on that small temporal mandibular joint right there. Okay, let's go to the table. So my partner supine, and let's see what we can find. So I'm gonna just ask my partner to just go ahead and clench and release and clench and release a little bit. And 
there we can even see the muscle tissue of the temporalis as it contracts. And as it contracts, there's a little dimpling right there on the side of the head. And if I'm not quite sure how big that attachment is, is it this big, is it this big, is it this big? Well, as he does that, I can just set my fingers on the side of the head, and there I can feel a little bit, and there I don't feel it, and there I don't feel it, but, ah, there I do. So I can get a good sense of where the edges of that temporalis muscle are by just setting them on the side of the head and seeing when I feel the muscle. Good, go ahead and relax. And now that we know where it is, I'm just gonna see if I can feel some of those fibers of the temporalis as they converge down to that zygomatic arch of the cheekbone. And this isn't obviously a muscle you're gonna be able to grasp with your fingers, but I can certainly feel the density of it here as it fills in that big space underneath that zygomatic arch. Let's take a moment to just find that. It's gonna run right here from the point of the cheekbone straight down toward the ear. And there I can just really roll my fingers across that ridge of bone. And so the temporalis passes underneath that and attaches at the coronoid process of the mandible. Well, when the jaw is closed, like right now, the coronoid process sits right there beneath the zygomatic arch. But if I ask my partner to go ahead and open your jaw fully, I can just set my finger right there in front of the edge of the masseter and there's a bony tip right there. Good, that's not uncomfortable? Uh, okay, and that's where the temporalis is going to attach. Now I'm not gonna feel the tendon per se so much, but that's the coronoid process right there. Good, go ahead and relax. And then as he closes his jaw, that coronoid process rises and falls underneath the zygomatic arch. And that's your temporalis. The four large muscles of the quadriceps femoris group primarily do one action. They extend the knee. The cylindrical superficial rectus femoris is located on the anterior thigh and is the only quadriceps that crosses two joints, the hip and knee. Vastus intermedius is deep to the rectus femoris. However, its edge can be accessed if the rectus femoris is shifted to the side. The palpable aspect of vastus medialis forms a teardrop shape at the distal portion of the medial thigh, while the vastus lateralis is the sole muscle of the lateral thigh. So before we go to the table, let's see the quadriceps femoris group in action. I'm gonna ask my partner to just flex his hip a little bit and then fully extend his knee. And there we can see a great example of all the quadriceps engaging. Here on the lateral side, we have that vastus lateralis. Here running right down the top, we see the rectus femoris. And there's that teardrop shape of the vastus medialis. So it's interesting just to note that the quadriceps really fill out the anterior, the top, and this lateral surface of the thigh. They cover a lot of ground. Good, and relax. So now let's go to the table and isolate these. Okay. Let's begin by isolating the rectus femoris. So the rectus femoris is that quadricep that runs right along the top of the thigh. There you go. We can see it running from the AIIS to the patella. So let's isolate those landmarks. First, the patella is that really quite obvious circular landmark here right on the top of the knee. Very accessible, easy to get our hands on. And eventually, all of the tendon of the quadriceps will merge onto that common patellar tendon and then attach here at that tibial tuberosity. So those are some landmarks. Then, on the other hand, we have the AIIS. That's the anterior inferior iliac spine. So we know that the ASIS is this prominent bony landmark right here. And to find the AIIS, I'm just gonna slide my fingers inferior and medial and work my fingers deep right there. And that's where the rectus femoris attaches. And if I ask my partner, go ahead and extend your knee and flex your hip a little bit. Wow, 
right there. A tendon is attaching right at that point. Good. Go ahead and relax. So from there, I can follow that tendon as it becomes a muscular belly right here. And I can even roll my fingers across it all the way down the top surface of the thigh. Really get my fingers on both sides of that belly. As it comes all the way down, it becomes tendinous here at the patella. So here's our rectus femoris. Now, deep to that is going to be the vastus intermedius. And since I was just finding the edge of the rectus, I'm going to just find that edge right there and work deep to it, sort of pushing the rectus femoris aside. And there I can feel the belly of the vastus intermedius deep to it. And that's one way you can access that fourth quadricep that's buried underneath the rectus, right in there. Good. So we've got the rectus femoris, the vastus intermedius deep to it, and then over here, we've got the vastus medialis. So go ahead and extend your knee again. Great. And there we can see that really nice teardrop shape of that accessible portion of the vastus medialis. And here we have the pathway of the sartorius muscle that sort of frames that medial side of the quadriceps. Good. Go ahead and relax. I'm just going to set my fingers right on this tissue. Quite a bulbous mass right here on the medial side of the thigh. And I can even roll my fingers across its fibers like so. And there it comes right up as it butts up against that rectus femoris. Good. So we've got three quadriceps here, the rectus femoris, vastus intermedius deep, and then the vastus medialis here on the medial side of the knee. And for the last quadricep, the vastus lateralis, I'll turn my partner on his side. So my partner sideline, and we'll finish with the vastus lateralis. Now, I could ask him to just extend his knee to see the muscle engage, but instead, I'm just going to ask him to contract the muscles of his thigh. Great. And there we can see that really big surface of the vastus lateralis on the lateral side of the thigh. Here we have that iliotibial tract coming right along superficially of the vastus lateralis. There's the tendon of the biceps femoris. But all of this tissue right here is going to be the vastus lateralis. It covers a lot of ground. And here we can see the division between the edge of the vastus lateralis and the biceps femoris, one of the hamstrings. Good. Go ahead and relax. So now that I know that all of this tissue here, from the greater trochanter basically down to the patella, is going to be the vastus lateralis, I can just sink my fingers into this tissue and see what we can feel. Now, superficially, I can feel, again, that those fibers of the iliotibial tract right here running down the thigh. But deep to it, I can feel the very solid mass and fibers of the vastus lateralis that are sort of heading in this direction, down toward the patella. I can feel them approximately up here, again, just below that greater trochanter, and then work my fingers all the way down. Finally, I can lengthen the quadriceps by flexing the knee, lengthening out all of these muscles here, and then I can shorten them, of course, by simply extending the knee. Now let's take a time out for a second. That guy had a great set of quads, but chances are most thighs aren't going to be that visually helpful. So what are you going to do? How do you locate the quads on a perfectly normal, regular thigh that doesn't have a lot of visual clues? Well, I would make the case that all you really need is a patella. Because if you can locate the patella, you can already have a very good sense of where the rectus femoris is in relationship to the other muscles as well. So for example, coming right off that patella, right toward that ASIS on the top of the thigh, right along that pathway to the ASIS, right there, prominent landmark, right along that path I know is going to be my rectus femoris. Then just medial in that teardrop shape, just proximal to the knee is going to be that vastus medialis. And then the vastus lateralis, of course, filling in this space right here on the side of the thigh. And if I ask my partner, go ahead and just kind of straighten your knee so she's contracting the quadriceps, 
skin. There's not a lot of visual clues when she contracts. But if I set my eyeballs into my hands, I can even close my eyes, there I can feel that tubular belly of the rectus femoris right on the top, really very solidly engaged. Over here medially is going to be that vastus medialis. And then here on the side of the thigh, very nicely contracted, is the vastus lateralis. Good, go ahead and relax. Good, and when she relaxes, all of this softens. You can even get a sense of that iliotibial tract passing superficial to the vastus lateralis. So even though I can't see anything, I can get a very strong sense of exactly where these muscles are located. And that's what you can do as well anywhere in the body when you can't visually notice something, but you can get a sense of its general location. The hamstrings are located along the posterior thigh between the vastus lateralis and the adductor magnus. As a group, the hamstrings and their tendons are easily palpable. Biceps femoris is the lateral hamstring. It has two heads, a superficial long head and a deeper, indiscernible short head. The medial hamstrings include the two semi-muscles, the semi-tendinosus, which lies superficial to the wider and deeper semi-membranosus. So the hamstrings, they get their name from 18th century butchers who used to hang hog carcasses in their window from the hamstring tendons. Doesn't really have a lot to do with what we're talking about here, but it's still kind of interesting. So let's palpate the hamstrings. My partner's prone on the table, and I'm gonna begin by asking my partner to just bring his foot toward his hip, so he's flexing the knee. Go ahead and give me a little resistance there. There you go. And there we can see a great example of the hamstring. We've got the semi-tendinosus belly here, the semi-membranosus deep to it, and here's that biceps femoris laterally, and there's that tendon coming around to the head of the fibula. Great, and relax. So let's take a moment to notice that the hamstrings really only fill up that central portion of the posterior thigh, unlike the quadriceps. It's really quite a small region right here. And if I ask my partner to go ahead and contract again a little more, there we have a visible line that separates the biceps femoris from the vastus lateralis. And there we have the line between the semi-hamstrings and the adductors over here. Good. So let's isolate the one bony landmark at the base of the pelvis where all the hamstrings attach. Here, just past the gluteal fold, is the ischial tuberosity right there. And if you've ever sat through a long concert on a hard chair, you know where your ischial tuberosity is. And that's the attachment for the hamstring. So I'm gonna ask my partner to just raise his foot up a little, and wow, right there, I feel the broad, strong tendon of all the hamstrings. Good, and relax. And from there, I can work my fingers down and feel here on the lateral side, the biceps femoris belly. There as it becomes tendinous here on the lateral side of the knee. And then I can go back to the ischial tuberosity and follow the pathway of the semi-tendinosus and membranosus. Tendinosus sits on top and there all the way down to the medial side of the knee. Go ahead and just hold your foot up right there. There we go. There's that semi-tendinosus tendon. And then deep to it inside a little bit is the semi-membranosus. And then there was that biceps femoris tendon here. So finally, we can shorten the hamstring by flexing the knee and even extending the hip a little bit. And we can lengthen the hamstrings by extending the knee. And if my partner were supine, I could even flex the hip. The three gluteal muscles are located in the buttock region, deep to the surrounding adipose tissue. The large superficial gluteus maximus is the most posterior of the group and has fibers that run diagonally across the buttock. The gluteus medius is located on the lateral side of the hip and is also superficial, except for the posterior portion, which is deep to the maximus. The gluteus minimus lies deep to the gluteus medius and is inaccessible. However, its dense fibers can be felt 
beneath the medius. So let's begin with the gluteus maximus. I'm going to begin by engaging the muscle. I'm going to just ask my partner to extend his hip a little bit, and there we can see the gluteus maximus here on the posterior surface of the buttock. Here we have that dimpling that forms by the gluteus medius and minimus on the lateral surface. There's that gluteal fold. Here, of course, is the hamstrings that penetrate underneath the gluteus maximus to attach at that ischial tuberosity. Now, just as my partner holds this here, I'm going to notice that the buttock always has a superficial layer of adipose on it, and the gluteals are deep to that superficial adipose tissue. Good. Go ahead and relax. Good. So now that we know that the gluteus maximus is here on the posterior aspect of the buttock, I'm going to just locate a few key bony landmarks that really outline it. Up here, I'm going to begin at the PSIS, that posterior superior iliac spine. It's that dimple that we find often in the low back. And from there, I'm going to just walk my fingers down along the edge of the sacrum, all the way to the coccyx right there. And that ridge from the coccyx all the way along the edge of the sacrum to the PSIS, and continuing along that posterior iliac crest, that long line is going to be the one side of the gluteus maximus. And then the muscle descends at an angle to attach at the gluteal tuberosity. Now, how are we going to find that? Well, there on the side of the hip is the greater trochanter, that very prominent knob that I can find right here on the side of the hip. If I'm not quite sure, I can always rotate the hip like so and really feel it move under my fingers. Well, I'm going to just walk my fingers distally on the posterior surface of that femur right about there, and that's going to be the area of the gluteal tuberosity. It's not like a big point or anything. It's just a region on the back of the femur. And then if I ask my partner to engage again, there we can even see all of that muscle tissue running right to there. Good. And go ahead and relax. Now that I've identified it, I can really get my fingers on a lot of this tissue right here. And all of that tissue that I'm grasping is going to be the gluteus maximus. I can even roll my fingers across the fibers like so. And finally, before we go to the gluteus medius and minimus, here's how you can shorten and lengthen the maximus. To shorten it, I can laterally rotate the hip. And to lengthen it, I can medially rotate it. So medially rotating the hip lengthens it, and laterally rotate shortens those fibers. Great. And now let's turn our partner sideline for the medius and the minimus. So now that my partner is sideline, I've got the top leg bolstered. I'm going to begin by engaging the gluteus medius and minimus. I'm going to ask my partner to just raise up his leg a little bit, AB ducting at the hip, and there we can see a nice example of where the gluteus medius sits on the lateral side of the hip. And then deep to the gluteus medius, there we can see the gluteus minimus. And here, my partner, I can see a bit of the TFL, the tensor fascia lata muscle, sitting right beside it. Great. Go ahead and relax. Now, with that in mind, let's isolate some bony landmarks that really surround the gluteus medius and minimus. First, I'm going to find the PSIS. That's that dimple on the low back. And I'm going to walk my fingers along the iliac crest right here. And I'm going to follow it all the way to the ASIS. Now, the gluteus medius doesn't go all that way. It goes about 3 quarters of the way along that iliac crest. But that C-shaped line right here, that's going to be one of the outlines for the gluteus medius and minimus. And then on the other end, as the fibers start here and then converge distally, they're going to attach at the greater trochanter of the femur. And that's that very prominent landmark we see right there on the side of the hip. So that's where all of our gluteus medius and minimus is going to be. And go ahead and contract again. Just kind of raise your leg up. Great. And there I can definitely feel all of that tissue really engage. And go ahead and relax. And with it now in a relaxed state, I can really set my fingers into the side of this hip and feel how those fibers again converge right down to that greater trochanter. Now, where's the minimus? The minimus is directly beneath the medius. 
So I'm not going to really be able to access it specifically, but I know that part of this muscle tissue I'm feeling in here is the gluteus minimus. And finally, we can just differentiate that edge of the gluteus medius here from that tensor fascia lata by asking my partner to just medially rotate at the hip. So he's just raising his foot up. And right there, I can feel that belly of the TFL that sits right along this, the gluteus medius. And relax. Sure enough, when he relaxes, all of that tissue softens up. The five adductors are located along the medial thigh between the hamstrings and quadriceps femoris muscles. Their proximal tendons attach at specific locations along the base of the pelvis. When the thigh is viewed anteriorly, the muscle bellies of the adductors lie in three layers. The pectineus and adductor longus are most anterior. Then behind them is the adductor brevis and most posterior is the adductor magnus. The fifth adductor, gracilis, lies superficially on the medial thigh. It is the only adductor that crosses the knee. Although their individual bellies may be challenging to isolate, as a group, the adductors are easy to locate. So before we access the adductors, let me answer a question that might be on your mind. How do we locate structures here on the medial thigh without contacting the genitals? It's a fair and appropriate question. Well, in short, all of these tendons and muscles and bony landmarks can be accessed without contacting the genitals. If you follow the instructions given, both the comfort of you and your partner will be maintained. And as a suggestion, I encourage you to explore and locate these structures on yourself first. It just lends confidence. Now, with all that said, it should be obvious that palpation on a male is complicated by the location of the penis and testicles. But there's a couple things you can do. First of all, I can just put my thigh on the table like so and flex and laterally rotate my partner's thigh, bringing all of this tissue away from the groin. The other thing I can do is I can always ask my partner to shift his genitals to the side. For example, more what I'd like to do is access the adductors here on the inner thigh that attach at the base of the pelvis. Would you be willing to just shift your genitals to the side, just getting them out of the way? Sure. That'd be great. So he agrees, he does so, and now I know that both myself and my partner will be comfortable. So let's begin by seeing the adductors engaged. I'm going to again just flex and laterally rotate my partner's thigh like so. And I'm just going to put my hand on his medial knee and ask him to just try to adduct his thigh. Great. And there we can really see a nice example of the adductors as they fit right there on the medial thigh. Here we've got the line of the sartorius forming the anterior edge of where the adductors are. And back here posteriorly, we have the biceps femoris. And right in this V, sort of right there, we're going to have the adductors. And if I set my hand right there, wow, this tissue is really engaged as he adducts. Great. And relax. So before we isolate specific muscle bellies of the adductor group, I want to locate the bony landmarks of where all these muscles attach at the base of the pelvis. And the first landmark I'm going to find is the pubic crest. Now, you might remember that from the rectus abdominis. That was the one that was about six or eight inches below the navel. So I'm going to ask my partner if you want to find your pubic crest for me. There you go. And may I? OK. And so there's his pubic crest, very prominent, just above that pubic hair line. And from there, I'm going to just walk my fingers laterally out in the direction of the ASIS, that prominent bony landmark right there, and deep to this inguinal ligament that passes between the ASIS and the pubic crest is going to be the superior ramus of the pubis. That's going to be the attachment for the pectineus muscle. Then, if we walk our fingers back, I'll follow this bony ridge as it curls all the way around the medial side of the thigh to the ischial tuberosity. And there we can just feel that bony ridge. And I can feel tendons from the adductors sort of penetrating and attaching right there. 
and we can follow all the way back around to that ischial tuberosity. Now, it's interesting, the ischial tuberosity is that bony landmark at the base of the buttocks. And what's curious is there is a continual bony line from the pubic crest all the way around to the ischial tuberosity. And that's going to serve as attachment sites for the adductors. Good. So now let's see if we can isolate a few specific bellies. I'm going to ask my partner to just adduct again. There you go. And I'm just going to set my hand there. And I'm going to find a prominent tendon, sort of right here at the apex of the adductors. Good. Keep, keep adducting a little bit. And right there is a prominent tendon that goes right to the base of the pelvis. Good. And relax. Now that prominent tendon will either be the gracilis, the adductor longus, or both. And it's a great benchmark to get a handle on the muscles that are anterior to that tendon and posterior. I'll show you. So I'll find that tendon and follow it distally. And as I do so, there is about a two-finger-wide muscle belly that runs superficially down the medial thigh. And that must be the gracilis, because the adductor longus is going to head this way. And so I've got the gracilis, nice and superficial, right here, running all the way down and attaching here at that pes anserinus region. And then if I go back to that tendon and fall a little bit anterior, there I can feel a bit of the adductor longus. Go ahead and adduct just a little bit. Great. And there I can feel a real solid contraction as the adductor longus seems to penetrate underneath the sartorius and disappear into the thigh. So we've got gracilis, adductor longus, and then if I continue up this way into that sort of corner of the thigh, that's where I'm going to find the pectineus. And this time, go ahead and flex a little bit. Flex your knee toward your, there you go. Great. And there's a little contraction of the pectineus underneath my fingers. Great. And relax. Now, one thing to note about the pectineus is running superficial to it will be the femoral artery, nerve, and vein. So if your partner complains of any tingling or you feel a strong pulse under your fingers, go ahead and shift your fingers appropriately. Okay, so we've got pectineus, adductor longus, and gracilis. Where's the adductor brevis? It's deep right here to the adductor longus and pectineus. And then finally, you're probably wondering, where's the big one, adductor magnus? Well, adductor magnus is going to be deep to all of these right in here. And for that, we're going to turn my partner sideline. So my partner's sideline, and I've got his top leg bolstered, and I'm just going to begin by asking him to just adduct his thigh. So he's going to try to raise his thigh up a little bit, and there we can see all of that tissue of the adductors that we saw from a supine position. And there's the edge of the adductors, here being the hamstrings, and there again is that sartorius muscle and the quadriceps. So all in that V, that's the adductors. Good. Go ahead and relax. So the adductor magnus is going to be located more on the posterior side of where that prominent tendon was. So go ahead and adduct again. And I can follow these up. And there's that prominent tendon right there of the gracilis and the adductor longus. So go ahead and relax. And I know that all of this tissue here, right up to that ischial tuberosity right there, is going to be the adductor magnus, a very dense, thick muscle, and filling in that space. And the adductor magnus is going to come all the way down and attach at the adductor tubercle here at the bottom of the femur. And if I ask my partner to just adduct your thigh again, I can feel there's that adductor magnus becoming more tendinous and very thin band. And sure enough, it attaches right there at that adductor tubercle, right on the side of the leg. It's that place your brother used to pinch when you were a kid, make you squeal. Well, that's the adductor magnus tendon attaching right there. Great. Go ahead and relax. So to lengthen the adductors, I can simply abduct the thigh like so. And to shorten them, I can return the leg back to neutral, adducting the thigh. One last note about the adductors. I encourage you to explore and palpate them on as many people as possible. Because they're on the inner thigh, you may be a little hesitant to explore there. 
but it's all the more reason to do so. And on behalf of all your future clients who may have a groin pull or an imbalanced pelvis, being confident, comfortable, and experienced with the adductors is a really good thing. The tensor fascia lata, or TFL, is a small superficial muscle located on the lateral side of the upper thigh. Approximately three fingers wide, the TFL is easily accessible between the upper fibers of the rectus femoris and the gluteus medius. So chances are if you've ever gotten in an automobile, you're familiar with your TFL because it involves flexion, medial rotation, and abduction of the hip. Don't I look ready to just jump into my Maserati, huh? Well, let's see if we can access a little bit of the TFL now. So I'm going to first find the ASIS. It's that prominent bony landmark right on the top of the hip, right there. And then I'm going to just walk my fingers back along the iliac crest a little bit right here. And that little two-inch region right there is sort of that top edge of where the TFL is going to be. And then I can pretty much run down the side of the thigh like so, and there we can see where that TFL is located. Good. And if I want to see this muscle engaged, I'm going to ask my partner to just try to medially rotate her hip against my resistance. So go ahead and try to medially rotate. Great. And if I set my hand right along that pathway, wow, sure enough, there's a very solid tubular muscle right there. I can even get my fingers on either side of it as it descends down the thigh. Pretty much ends right around here. Great. Go ahead and relax. And then when it's relaxed, I can really roll my fingers across those fibers that run in this direction. Now, how far down does the TFL go? Well, pretty much to the level of the greater trochanter. And I can find that by just setting my hand on the side of the thigh right here. I can passively rotate the hip a little bit, and there underneath my fingers I can feel the bony prominence of the greater trochanter. So this is going to be our TFL, our tensor fascia lata muscle. Well, at that point it blends into the iliotibial tract. So let's explore that for a moment. The iliotibial tract comes from here at the gluteal fascia, blends and sort of funnels and converges fascially as it descends down the lateral side of the leg finally attach here at that tibial tubercle. So if I want to just access a little of that iliotibial tract, I can just set my hand on the side of the thigh and deep to the iliotibial tract, first of all, will be the vastus lateralis fibers. And they're going to sort of curl and run this way. But if I work very superficially, I can feel those really dense fascial tissue that runs this way. And as I get closer to the knee, these fibers bundle together. There, my fingers are on either side. And it feels, frankly, a bit like duct tape. I mean, it's like really, really tough tissue. And that's going to be that distal portion of the iliotibial tract here, superficial to that vastus lateralis muscle. So that's just a little bit of the iliotibial tract as it descends the lateral side of the leg. Sometimes known as the deep six, these six small muscles are located deep to the gluteus maximus and create lateral rotation of the hip, all attached to aspects of the greater trochanter and fan medially to attach to the sacrum and pelvis. All of the lateral rotators are deep to the large sciatic nerve, except for the piriformis. The piriformis lies superficial to the sciatic nerve and if overcontracted, can compress it. Nevertheless, the lateral rotators are accessible as a group, with the piriformis and quadratus femoris being the most discernible. So we'll focus on two of the lateral rotators of the hip. First, the piriformis. And let's just superimpose the muscle. There it is. We can see it running diagonally across the buttock from the sacrum to the greater trochanter deep to that gluteus maximus. We kind of have a sense, of course, of where this muscle is, but there's three landmarks that will really help us isolate it. Those are going to be the PSIS here, the coccyx, and the greater trochanter. And you can see how my three fingers form a T, and across the base of that T will be the piriformis. So let's isolate those landmarks. 
Here's going to be that dimple on the low back, which is where the PSIS, that posterior superior iliac spine is. And if you get a little lost, you can always find the iliac crest and find it there. And then from the PSIS, I can walk along the edge of the sacrum all the way down to the coccyx. But now let's stop for a second, because chances are you've never palpated your own coccyx, let alone your partner's. So let's take a moment to do that. If you stand on up, you can find the surface of your sacrum just here in between your buttocks. And then if you follow it inferiorly, it ends at the coccyx. And the coccyx is pretty much in the gluteal cleft, just at the very top. The gluteal cleft being, if you will, the crack between the cheeks. And that's at the very bottom of the vertebral column where the coccyx is going to be located. Okay, so how we can find that on our partner is I'm going to find the edge of the sacrum there, sort of pressing my fingers right into the edge of it. And then I'm just going to work through the sheet and find the very bottom of the vertebral column there. And that's going to be the location of the coccyx. So we've got the coccyx and the PSIS. And then the third landmark is that greater trochanter. It's that superficial point of bone here on the outside of the hip. If I ever get really confused, I can just rotate the thigh a little bit and move the hip, and I can feel it pass underneath my fingers. So now we've found our T. And right along that base is going to be the piriformis. So I'm going to just set my fingers just along that line and work them slowly through the adipose tissue of the buttock and the thick belly of the gluteus maximus. And there we can really feel that sort of one or two finger wide belly of the piriformis. And if I ask my partner to just try to laterally rotate his hip a little bit against my resistance, so he's going to try to go that way, and I'm going to give him some resistance. Go ahead. There we go. Underneath my finger, I feel a very solid contraction of this muscle. And go ahead and relax, and it softens up as he relaxes. And I can follow it medially as it passes underneath the edge of the sacrum. And then I can follow it laterally as it heads out toward the greater trochanter, becoming thinner along its way. Now, let's just recognize that deep to the piriformis is the sciatic nerve. And there we can see that. But if I'm using a nice, broad finger pads, and I'm not pressing too deep, I'm going to be just fine. So that's one lateral rotator, the piriformis. The second is going to be the quadratus femoris. And there you can see it there running from that ischial tuberosity over toward the greater trochanter. So let's just locate those landmarks again. I'm going to find my partner's ischial tuberosity right here at the sort of bottom of the buttock and just pressing in. It's that sits bone right at the base of the pelvis. And then I'm going to walk over and find that posterior portion of the shaft of the femur right there. And that is where the quadratus will be attaching. So I'll just set my fingers up underneath the gluteus maximus and feel for the quadratus femoris spanning between these landmarks. And again, I'm going to ask my partner to go ahead and laterally flex a little bit against my resistance. Great. And just a little contraction a little effort forms a nice, solid contraction of that muscle right there. Go ahead and relax. And as he relaxes, that muscle really softens. I can even roll my fingers across the quadratus femoris fibers like so. Great. So we've got two of the lateral rotators right there. And to shorten the entire group of lateral rotators, I can laterally rotate the hip. And to lengthen them, I can medially rotate at the hip. So shortening the lateral rotators and lengthening the lateral rotators. The iliacus and psoas major, together called the iliopsoas, are important hip flexors and low back stabilizers. The long, slender psoas major is located deep to the abdominal contents. It stretches from the lumbar vertebrae underneath the inguinal ligament to the lesser trochanter of the femur. The stockier iliacus is located deep to the abdomen in the iliac fossa. So before we access the psoas and iliacus, a few tips. 
First, any time I explore down into the abdomen or even coming back out, I'm going to use nice slow movements and soft finger pads. Secondly, I'm going to note that the abdominal aorta passes right down the center of the abdomen. And if while I'm accessing, I feel its pulse, I'm going to just bring my fingers out and just shift a little bit further laterally. And lastly, I'm going to let my partner know that if any time you feel uncomfortable and you wish to stop, you just let me know. Okay. So let's begin with the psoas major. And let's begin by first seeing it on the abdomen. And there we can see as it passes from the lumbar vertebrae diagonally down toward that lesser trochanter of the femur. So I know that it basically runs right here, but how can I sort of find a way to access it? Well, here's the way. I'm going to locate the ASIS, that prominent bony landmark on the front of the hips, and the umbilicus, or navel. Well, if I draw a line between these two points, right at the middle of that line, right there, is where I'm going to want to set my fingers to access some of the psoas major. So, right there along that line, and I'm going to just very slowly and softly work my fingers in. I'm going to encourage my partner to just take a few deep breaths, take a few deep breaths. Great. And I'm going to use some nice sort of circles to sort of help move some of the intestines out of the way. And I'm working my fingers at an angle. I'm going in this direction, sort of toward the center line of the body. And I believe right about there, I'm at the level of the psoas. So what I'm going to ask my partner to do is just bring your knee toward your shoulder like a half an inch. So she's going to try to flex her hip. And sure enough, when she does that, right underneath my fingers is a real solid contraction. And go ahead and relax. And when she relaxes, my fingers sort of sink in a little more. Go ahead and contract. And when she, again, flexes her hip, this muscle engages, and my fingers actually kind of push out a little bit. And then as you relax, my fingers sink a little further in. So I know that I'm on a portion of the psoas major right there. And so I'm going to just slowly bring my fingers out, like so. So I can do pretty much the same thing a little bit further superior and a little bit further inferior anywhere along that path of the psoas major. And that's a little idea of how you can access the psoas major in a supine position. But before we turn our partner's sideline, let's take a look at the iliacus. So there we can see it as it lays in the iliac fossa right there. So the strategy for this muscle, because most of it's going to be pretty much inaccessible, is I'm going to try to scoop my fingers around the iliac crest. So I'm going to find that ASIS, that prominent landmark there. And here we have that iliac crest. And I'm just going to set my fingers right on the medial side of that iliac crest right there. And for this, I'm just going to bring up my partner's thigh like so and just holding on to it. And this softens up the tissue a lot more. And as my fingers slowly sink into this tissue, I'm going to ask my partner, go ahead and try to flex your hip a little, bringing your knee toward your shoulder. And wow, right underneath my fingers is a real solid contraction of this muscle that sits in that iliac fossa. Good, relax. And as she relaxes, my fingers sink in a little bit more as this muscle relaxes. Good. And I'm just going to slowly bring my fingers out like so. Great. And that's a great way we can access the iliacus in a supine position. So now let's turn our partner sideline and see what we can find there. So my partner's in a sideline position. And just for a moment, let's take a look again at where the psoas and the iliacus are. There's that psoas again coming from the lumbar vertebrae all the way down to attach to the femur. And there in that iliac fossa, is the iliacus. Good. So the great thing about sideline position is that the abdominal contents shift down toward the table. So what I'm going to do is pretty much the same thing we did when she was supine, is I'm going to locate those two landmarks, the ASIS right here and the umbilicus, and I'm just going to set my hand and my fingers right here along that line, and I'm going to very slowly work my fingers in, sort of following my partner's breath. about there, I 
feel as though I'm at the level of where the psoas might be. So I'm going to ask my partner, go ahead and just bring your knee again, just a pinch towards your shoulder. Great. And as she tries to flex the hip right there, I can feel that muscle contract. And then go ahead and relax. And my fingers sink in a little bit deeper. You're doing okay? Yeah. Okay. And so we can access right along that line of the psoas here. I can even come up a little bit higher here or even a little bit lower down in here more in the iliac fossa. So for the iliacus, I've come around to the other side of the table and I'm going to begin by locating that ASIS right there and walking my fingers back along that iliac crest. And then I'm just going to sink my fingers in a little medial to that right into that tissue where the iliacus is. And what's great is that her hips are flexed, so all this tissue is shortened, and since she's sidelined, all the abdominal contents have fallen down toward the table a little bit. And there, I can very slowly and easily work my fingers into that iliac fossa right there. And if you try to bring your knee toward your shoulder a little, great. And that muscle definitely engages, and then relax. And there, it definitely softens. And I can really work my fingers along this iliac crest to access some of that iliacus. And that's just a little bit of how you can access the psoas and iliacus from a supine and sideline position. The large muscle mass of the posterior leg is composed of the gastrocnemius and the soleus muscles. Together, they form what is known as the triceps surae that attaches to the strong calcaneal or Achilles tendon. The superficial gastrocnemius has two heads and crosses two joints, the knee and ankle. The soleus is deep to the gastrocnemius, yet its medial and lateral fibers bulge out from the sides of the leg and extend further distal than the gastroc heads. So, before we go to the table and palpate, let's just see these muscles in action. I'm going to ask my partner to just stand up on his toes, and as he plantar flexes the ankle, wow, what a great example of the gastroc and soleus. Here we have that lateral head of the gastrocnemius. There's the medial head there. Here we see a bit of the soleus bulging out the sides and coming out underneath as it blends in with that calcaneal tendon here at the calcaneus. And now let's turn them around. Go ahead and face the other direction and stand up on your toes. And notice that the gastroc and soleus are visible from an anterior view as well. Here's that edge of the shaft of the tibia and all of this tissue right here is the soleus as it bulges out the side. You can even see a bit of the gastroc head here and here coming out the side as well. And so all of that is part of the muscle tissue that we'll be accessing on the table. So let's go do that. So my partner's prone on the table and we'll begin by isolating the gastrocnemius. I'm gonna just set my hand on my partner's foot and ask him to just try to step on the gas a little bit. Great, and as he plantar flexes, there again we can see those gastrocnemius heads right here. And if you ever get lost and you can't figure out exactly how long or short they are, you can pretty much divide the leg in half, and right at that half point will be the bottom of the gastrocnemius heads. And if I want to get my fingers on them, I can just really grasp some of this superficial tissue of the calf. Now notice, I'm not grasping all of this. No, that's the gastroc and the soleus. No, we're just looking for the gastrocnemius here. And I can follow the bellies up to the back of the knee. And if I ask my partner, just try to bring your heel toward your hip. That's right. So he's, as he tries to flex the knee, there we can see the hamstring tendons. And that's where the gastroc heads pass in between those tendons to disappear into the back of the knee where they attach under the condyles of the femur. Now those are the gastrocnemius heads, and deep to those will be the soleus. And really, if you grasp the tissue of the calf, that deeper, really massive amount of tissue will be the soleus. 
Yes, the three flexors are deep to the soleus, but they're really quite small. This will be the soleus, and I can follow it distally as it blends into that calcaneal or Achilles tendon to attach there at the calcaneus. Good. Now, a fun little way that you can differentiate the gastroc from the soleus is you can flex the knee and ask your partner to step on the gas. Now, since the gastrocnemius is an ineffectual plantar flexor, in this position, it doesn't really engage. It's nice and flaccid. But deep to it, all of this tissue that is engaging is all the soleus. So it's a fun way to sort of turn off the gastrocnemius. Great, and relax. And finally, if we want to shorten the gastrocnemius, I can flex the knee and plantar flex the ankle. Plantar flexing the ankle also shortens the soleus. And to lengthen the gastrocnemius, I can extend the knee and even just dorsiflex the ankle. And dorsiflexing the ankle will also lengthen the soleus. The plantaris has a short muscle belly, but the longest tendon in the body. Its belly lies at an oblique angle along the popliteal space of the posterior knee between the gastrocnemius heads. Its tendon extends down the length of the leg and attaches to the calcaneus. Although the plantaris belly is situated in a small, cramped area, it can be readily accessed. Ah, the plantaris. It's a major muscle of propulsion on a reptile, but for us, it's a mere remnant of what used to be. But nevertheless, let's see if we can find it. So I'm going to begin by asking my partner to just try to bring her heel toward her hip. There you go. And we can see there's the bellies of the gastrocnemius as they dive into the popliteal space. There's the hamstring tendons. And I'm going to just set my thumb right into that popliteal space above the gastrocnemius heads and relax. So my thumb naturally falls right in between the heads. And a little hint, I'm going to shift it just a little bit further proximal. And I'm going to flex the knee to soften the overlaying tissue. And I'm just going to slowly work my thumb in and see if I can locate the diagonal belly of the plantaris as it becomes a tendinous string all the way down the back of the leg to attach at the calcaneus. So the tendon is, of course, inaccessible. But I'm going to sink my finger in here and just see if I can find that small diagonal belly of the plantaris. And there's a structure I just sort of clunk right across, probably about a finger width, and that's our plantaris. Now, I can just check to be sure if I'm where I want to be. I'm in the popliteal space, I'm between the gastroc heads, and I feel a muscle belly about finger width that runs diagonally across the back of the knee. Great, And that's your plantaris. Yes, it might be bigger on a lizard, but good luck trying to palpate it. As its name suggests, the popliteus is located in the popliteal space. This muscle has a small, short belly with diagonal fibers. And lying beneath the upper fibers of the gastrocnemius and plantaris, it is the deepest muscle of the posterior knee. So what we're going to do to access just a portion of it is flex the knee and locate the tibial tuberosity. Tibial tuberosity is that bony landmark on the anterior leg where the quadriceps attach. And there it is right there. And what I'm going to do is just walk my fingers around that shaft of the tibia until I'm pretty much on the posterior surface right there. And here we have that superficial uh, soleus and gastrocnemius muscles. But my fingers are going to just slip underneath them on that posterior surface of the tibia. And that location is where you're going to find the distal tendinous attachment of the popliteus. Now, it's not like a big muscle or anything. It's not like you're, like you're going to feel a big structure. It's more or less just a portion of bone where the tendon attaches. And just to note, I'm distal to where the pesant serinus tendons come and attach here on the tibia. So those are the semitendinosus, sartorius, and gracilis. And they're passing here, and my fingers are going to come just distal right to there. And even though the popliteus is a weak flexor of the knee, it plays the vital role 
of unlocking the knee from a fully extended position, which is where it gets its nickname, the key which unlocks the knee. The slender peroneal muscles are located on the lateral side of the fibula between the extensor digitorum and the soleus. A portion of the peroneus brevis lies deep to the peroneus longus, yet both are accessible. So let's begin by isolating the two bony landmarks that frame out where the peroneals are on the lateral side of the leg. The first is going to be the head of the fibula, which is located here on that lateral side of the leg just below the level of the knee. I'm just going to set my broad finger pads here, and sure enough, there's a really prominent knob right there. And if I can't find it and I'm a little confused, I can always ask my partner to just try to bring your heel toward your butt a little bit. There you go. And as she tries to flex her knee, this tendon, the tendon of the biceps femoris, one of the hamstrings contracts, and it attaches right there at the head of the fibula. Good. Go ahead and relax. So first landmark is the head of the fibula. The other is going to be down at the other end of the leg here at the lateral malleolus, that really prominent landmark on the side of the ankle. In between these two landmarks, as we can see, will be the peroneals. There's the peroneus longus, there's the peroneus brevis, and the tendons pass behind the malleolus to attach down in the foot. And if I want to see these muscles engage, I can just ask my partner to evert her foot. So she's going to try to swing the sole of her foot out a little bit. And wow, you can even see the sort of depression that's formed as these peroneals engage right there. And so if I just set my fingers in that tissue, go ahead and relax. There I can even roll my fingers right across and over the belly of the peroneals. Good. So just for fun, go ahead and engage again. Just try to evert. Great. And the, that tissue really contracts. Good. And relax. So just to differentiate for a moment, if I fall to the anterior side of where the peroneals are, I sort of can feel the belly of the extensor digitorum longus, one of the extensors, there. And then if I fall over to the posterior side of the peroneals, there's a little ditch right there, that's going to be where the soleus and the gastrocnemius are. So the peroneals fit right here just between those two sides of those muscle groups. And then if I follow these muscle bellies distally, I can roll across their tendons, and they're pretty much all tendon here, and I can follow them as they pass behind the lateral malleolus. You can even see the peroneus brevis coming and attaching here at the base of the fifth metatarsal. And finally, if I wanted to lengthen the peroneals, I'm going to just dorsiflex the ankle, and I can even invert the foot. And to shorten them, I could plant our flex and evert the foot. So to lengthen them and to shorten them. And those are your peroneals, the two muscles here on the side of the leg. These three muscles are located on the anterior aspect of the leg between the shaft of the tibia and the peroneal muscles. The tibialis anterior is large, superficial, and the most clearly isolated of the group. It lies directly lateral to the tibial shaft. And then squeezed between the tibialis anterior and the peroneal muscles, is the extensor digitorum, which is partially superficial. The muscle belly of the extensor hallucis longus lies deep to the other two muscles and can be accessed only indirectly. The extensors of the ankle and toes basically fill up this region right here on the anterior and lateral side of the leg. There we can see a great example of where they all are positioned. Good. So let's begin with the tibialis anterior, which, as the name suggests, is next to the shaft of the tibia. And there we can see it alone on the front of the leg. So in order to get a sense of where it's located, I'm first going to find the shaft of the tibia. And probably the easiest thing to do is locate the medial malleolus here. And then I'm just going to slide my thumb proximally as it becomes the shaft of the tibia. That's the very superficial shin bone that runs up the entire length of the leg. And if I come back a little bit, I can sort of fall off laterally, off the shaft, just like so. And there's a very palpable edge of the shaft of the tibia. And as my thumb falls laterally, 
I'm now in the land of the tibialis anterior, right there. There's that belly, sort of a tubular belly running like so down past the ankle. And if I ask my partner to just dorsiflex your ankle, this muscle belly really engages. You can even see the sort of topography that it forms right there on the top of the leg. And if I follow it distally, it becomes tendinous. And there, we can see a really great example as the tendon passes over the top of the ankle and comes over here to attach on the medial side of the foot. You can really feel that tendon right there. And there's a couple of the retinacula that pass over the tendons to hold them down and in place. Good, and relax. And so now that it's relaxed, I can even roll my thumb across that tendon like so. And that's going to be my first extensor, the tibialis anterior. Now, if this is the location of the tibialis anterior, there we see it. Here we can also see next to it the extensor digitorum longus, that equally long belly that then branches off into four tendons that come to the toes. Good. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to locate the edge of that tibialis anterior. So there's the belly I'm sort of rolling over. And there's a little gap right there. And that gap is what separates the tibialis anterior from the peroneals. And if I set my thumb right into that space, there's another equally rounded belly that seems to run down the leg. And for this muscle, I'm going to just ask my partner to see if she can just extend her toes. She's going to try to pull all of her toes back a little bit. Wow. And this belly really engages. Now, go ahead and just for fun, go ahead and just kind of wiggle your toes. You're going to kind of flex them and extend them. Oh, sure. And right here, this muscle belly is definitely sort of undulating as she wiggles her toes. Great. And relax. So if I follow that down, I know that it's going to be just lateral to that tibialis anterior muscle. And go ahead and dorsiflex again. There we can see the tendon of the extensor digitorum pass, again, underneath those retinacula, and then divide into four tendons here on the top of the foot. And those are the tendons of the extensor digitorum longus. Great. And relax. Now, if this is my tibialis anterior, and here's my extensor digitorum, well, where's the extensor hallucis longus? Well, that's deep between the two. And an easy way to start with that muscle is to go ahead and just dorsiflex again. Great. And do you see this tendon right here? That's the tendon of the extensor hallucis longus. And it sort of penetrates right in between the tibialis anterior and the extensor digitorum. And you can see as it kind of goes right up in between those two and lays deep here underneath the two other extensors. Great, and relax. So we've got those three extensors. And finally, just one step further, just to note where they're at, here is going to be the peroneals on that lateral side of the leg. So really, the extensors are framed by that shaft of the tibia and the peroneal muscles here, running from that head of the fibula all the way down past around the lateral malleolus. And finally, if I wanted to shorten the extensors, I can passively dorsiflex my partner's ankle, and if I wanted to lengthen them, I can plantar flex the ankle. Buried deep to the gastrocnemius and soleus on the posterior leg are three slender muscles primarily responsible for inverting the foot and flexing the toes. All three muscles are virtually inaccessible, except at a small region on the medial side of the leg. So unlike the extensors of the leg, the flexors are tucked underneath the gastroc and soleus and are pretty much inaccessible. But there's a portion you can really get your fingers on. Let's give it a try. So my partner, Supine, I've got her leg bolstered here. And I'm going to first isolate the landmarks that surround the area where we can access part of the flexors. First is going to be here at the medial malleolus, that prominent bony landmark on the side of the ankle. And if I follow that proximally, it becomes the shaft of the tibia right here. And I can follow that up a good distance. And I can even curl my fingers underneath that edge like so. So we've got the medial malleolus and that edge and shaft of the tibia right here. Then we've also got this calcaneal or Achilles tendon. 
and I can feel that coming right off the calcaneus and follow it all the way up as it becomes the belly of the soleus. And there's that edge of the soleus coming like so. So what we've done is just formed a V, which is where we can find some of the flexors. Sort of formed here by, again, that shaft of the tibia, and here by the edge of the soleus and the calcaneal tendon. And that little V, or triangle, right here is where we can set our fingers for the flexors. So what I'm going to do is just set my thumb right into that space. And sure enough, there's some, some muscle tissue in there. And I know it's not the soleus, because that's further this way. And if I ask my partner to just invert her foot a little bit, so she's going to swing her foot this way, great. That tissue definitely engages. And that would be the flexors, because the soleus doesn't do that. And go ahead and relax. And if I really sink my thumb in here and roll across some of this, it's sort of a sinewy, sinewy sense of the muscles here with a lot of fibers running this way. And I can just really sink my thumb underneath that shaft of the tibia as far proximally as I can to just feel some of the density of those flexors. Well, then the flexors are going to come distally down around the medial malleolus as they become tendons here and then disappear into various aspects of the underside of the foot. So I can set my fingers right on the back of that malleolus and there I can feel some of those tendons passing behind the medial malleolus. And just for fun, if I ask my partner to just flex her toes a little bit, kind of flex and extend, kind of flex and relax, some of those tendons really engage as the flexor hallucis longus flexes the big toe and the flexor digitorum longus flexes all the other toes. Great, and you can really feel those engaged as she does that. Good. And finally, to lengthen the flexors, I can dorsiflex the ankle, and to shorten them, I can plantar flex the ankle.